Alexander Solonik, a.k.a. Alexander the Great, a.k.a. Sasha the Macedonian, a.k.a. the Super Killer, was a legendary and mysterious Russian hitman in the 1980s and 90s who carried out contract killings primarily for the Orokovskaya Russian Mafia group. His targets were generally the leaders of other criminal organizations, the hardest men to kill, men other contract killers had tried and failed to kill. Solonik is believed to have fulfilled at least 43 murder contracts, including the assassinations of roughly 30 high-level mob bosses, in addition to killing numerous other people. He also escaped from prisons and from courtrooms multiple times and apparently even fought 12 dudes at once in prison and one during one of his brief periods behind bars. This dude was deadly with his hands, a black belt in multiple martial arts, deadlier with a gun, trained by the Russian military to be an expert marksman. He was feared by other gangsters and authorities alike. Even the newspapers were in awe of Solonik's abilities. A reporter once wrote, Solonik could be called one of the best known and most ruthless contract killers. His nearly supernatural ability to disappear and emerge again might easily be compared to that of international terrorist Carlos the Jackal. We've done a lot of Russian-themed time sucks since this ride began, and this is a great addition to a catalog that now includes sucks on the KGB, Andrei Chikatilo, Baba Yaga, Joseph Stalin, Mikhail Popkov, the Russian sleep experiment, Alexander Pashushkin, the Dyatlov Pass incident, and Rasputin. And this is the second hitman we sucked after Richard the Iceman Kuklinski. And it's a very entertaining tale, so get ready to learn more about Russia and a lot about a man who was very hard to research. The life of Alexander Solonik shrouded in so much mystery on another true crime Russian edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday and yeah, 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 time suckers. Hope you're having a great day. Welcome or welcome back to the Cult of the Curious. Let's have some fun learning something new. I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. Our cult-like, critical-thinking, goofy church of irreverence is now in session. Maybe that'd be court. Court or church. I'll take either one. Thanks again for the continued ratings and reviews. It never gets old. Uh, appreciate the reviews and ratings on on all platforms. Uh, nice to see new listeners popping up in those feeds. Uh, thanks to all the new listeners who've hopped over from the Drinking Bros podcast, from Burtcast, from Whiskey Ginger, and more. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, and, and those are all great podcasts. And thanks to James and Jimmy of Small Town Murder and Crime and Sports. We're always talking about us and Tom and Dan and Mediocre Time, you know, with Tom and Dan for always pushing people our way. Also, those are great podcasts. And uh, special thanks to awesome comic Chad Daniels, over at the Great Middle of Somewhere podcast for saying really nice things recently about Time Suck and about my new stand-up special, Get Out of Here, Devil, available all over the place. Spotify, you know, uh, Amazon, uh, On Demand, all different kinds of places. He and Cy, great comics and podcasters, uh, a lot of great content out there. And uh, also a, a comic friend of mine, Mo Mandel, has a new show coming out this week on Discovery Channel. Airs May 20th at 10 p.m. It's called Small Town Throwdown. Mo visits towns with bad reputations, gives them a chance to tell their side of the story and improve their reputations. He heads to Lubbock, Texas in the pilot, apparently known as the most boring town in America. Then he heads to Appleton, Wisconsin, known for being the drunkest town in America. And he gives them a chance to show different sides of themselves. And knowing Mo, it'll be brutal and funny. I uh, love Mo, so check that out. Uh, my tour, Toxic Thought States, uh, those are still being rescheduled. Hoping to pick back up in August. Who knows? Some clubs are opening up in places now. Some are already opened up. Uh, it's all very tentative, all, all very maybe tenuous. It's a better word. It's the clubs that are opened up in a few places opened with limited capacity, but they may shut down again. Uh, promoting shows that may just get canceled again is not something I'm I'm real interested in. Something I'm trying to avoid. So when I when I have something that feels firm, I'll let you know. So hopefully August. Thanks for sending in messages asking about that. And thank you again to the Space Lizards who support us on Patreon. Allow us to donate. Donated fifty four hundred dollars this month. Excuse me, fifty four hundred to the Penn Fed Foundation. Um, yeah, and thanks, uh, Space Lizards, for being cool with uh, Thursday's episode. Coming out a few minutes late. A little tech glitch happens sometimes. Penn Fed, the first national veteran service organization to launch its COVID-19 relief program for emergency financial assistance uh, back in March. The mission of the Penn Fed Foundation for Military Heroes is to empower military service members, veterans, and their communities with the skills and resources to realize financial stability and opportunity. 
and they help veterans do all kinds of stuff, like go back to school, buy homes, pay their bills. You can go to penfedfoundation.org to find out more. Link in the episode description. And last announcement, new t-shirt in the store. Check out Digital Dreams at badmagicmerch.com where there's so much cool shit and it's always changing. It's always changing every week. Several new designs in there all the time. Okay, and now, now it's story time. Now uh, let us uh, know how to head back to Mother Russia. Yip, yip ya, comrade. Let us uh, raise glass to Nimrod. In the 90s, when Alexander Solonik, or Sasha, as he was more commonly known as, was a hitman, there were a lot of hitmen in Russia. There was a lot of murder, a lot of crime in general. The country's abrupt transition from communism to a free market economy created a huge black market and all the crime that comes with that. And with all that crime came a lot of hitmen. The Russian verb zakazait means to order. It can be used to order a pizza or a plane ticket or some beet soup, or maybe a series of wooden dolls where one fits inside another and as they grow smaller and smaller. And, you know, you can order a lot of things, uh, including death. It can be used to put out an order or a hit out on somebody to order someone's untimely demise to have them killed by a hired hitman. If Russian media accounts are to be believed, a hitman can be hired to kill someone for as little as a hundred bucks in some cases, or several hundred thousand dollars, possibly up to around seven figures for a target much more difficult to kill. The discount hitman. That sounds like an especially scary and questionable hire to get that first guy, right? You can pay uh, $300,000, you know, through untraceable cryptocurrency for some dude named Sergey, a man who spent 10 years in Russian special forces, who fought in several military clashes and worked in covert ops, you know, who elite sniper with black belts in multiple martial arts disciplines, an expert in using anthrax or ricin, other toxins and poisons, and, you know, disguise, expert in disguising his appearance to take down like a high ranking politician or businessman or underworld figure professional sorts, very unlikely to rat on you if you get caught. Or you can lock up Jerry for 100 rubles or so. You can get someone who spent 10 years in Russian prisons where his face was covered in cheap tattoos, uh, marking him as a, as a guy named uh, Vladimir's property. Jerry has a decent sucker punch. He's okay at not cutting himself and working with a knife. Jerry specializes in taking out people addicted to meth or opioids or homeless alcoholics. And Jerry would rat you out in a heartbeat if caught for a pack of smokes or the possibility of a reduced sentence. You want Ivan taken out, the old man with dirty beard and the limp who sleep behind the Ming Dynasty Chinese buffet in Kazakhstan. Ivan with no teeth to talk to pigeon. I, Ivan who poop on street and bark at school kids. Yes, I, I am right man for job. Jerry can make happen for a hundred ruble. I stab Ivan no less than ten times when he pass out drunk. That is, that is Jerry guarantee. A good hitman. Uh, to really understand the, the rise of hitmen in Russia, we need to first look at the fall of the Soviet Union. A wave of contract killings washed throughout Russia in the 1990s, sweeping away new bankers and businessmen. Because of all the money there was to be made in relative lawlessness, left in the power vacuum created by the fall of the USSR, the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. On Christmas Day, December 25th, 1991, the Soviet flag flew over the Kremlin in Moscow for the last time. Representatives from Soviet republics, Ukraine, Georgia, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, or Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, Uzbekistan had already announced that they would no longer be part of the Soviet Union. The Baltic Republics of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, I like those places better because they're easier for me to say, uh, they'd already declared an independence from the USSR. Things had fallen apart quickly. And we have Gorbachev to thank for that. Mikhail Gorbachev, last leader of the Soviet Union, was the architect of the USSR's demise. That guy with the birthmark on top of his head that I, uh, I thought was the, the hammer and sickle. Symbols from the Soviet Union's pla flag for a while as a kid. Like I literally thought he had Soviet symbols tattooed onto his head to show how committed he was to Russia. I thought a lot of weird shit as a kid. Gorbachev became the communist leader in 1985 and 1988. Time magazine had selected him as its man of the year. 1990, Time named him the man of the decade. Also in 1990, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was his radical reforms that led directly to the dissolution of the USSR. He introduced two sets of policies that he'd hoped would help the Soviet Union become a more prosperous, productive nation. The first of these was known as Glasnost, or political openness. Uh, Glasnost eliminated uh, traces of Stalinist repression, like the banning of books and the omnipresent secret police. 
and it gave new freedoms to Soviet citizens. Political prisoners were released. Newspapers could print criticisms of the government, which was very new. For the first time, parties other than just the Communist Party could participate in elections. And shutting down the secret police, that was huge. And while it let the average Russian citizen breathe a whole hell of a lot easier, now they didn't have to worry about being sent to some prison camp because their neighbor reported them for not being communist enough, it also led to them worrying a lot more about gangsters robbing, exploiting, and or killing them. People lost one fear only to, at least initially, gain a new one. The second set of reforms was known as perestroika, economic restructuring. Gorbachev thought the best way to revive the Soviet economy, which was faltering, was to loosen the government's grip on it. He felt that private initiative would lead to a lot more business innovation than it had under communism, so individuals and cooperatives were allowed to own businesses for the first time in Russia since the 1920s. It had been six decades since someone could own their own business in Russia. How crazy is that? Lots of Russians had managed businesses on behalf of the state, but they didn't actually own them. Gorbachev also suddenly encouraged foreign investment in Soviet enterprises. And then these reforms did not work out at all. Not at all like he'd hoped. And he walked away disappointed in how the massive communistic world power had broken apart. In his farewell address, he said, the old system collapsed before the new one had time to begin working. Rationing shortages and long lines for scarce goods seemed to be the only results the average Russian citizen initially saw as a result of Gorbachev's policies in the late 80s when Russia's economy was in the toilet and he actually was hated by a lot of Russians who felt that life was now much worse than it was when they lived under the iron thumb of communism. And Bojangles just punched a hole in the suck dungeon wall. Great. I forgot how riled up our one-eyed, three-legged pit bull good boy mascot of the suck gets when I talk about communism. Sometimes I forget that Bojangles used to run missions for the CIA against communist forces. Easy, Bojangles, easy. I'm, I'm talking about communism ending in this tale. It's a good thing. Anyway, Russians had been told to do business or what to do business-wise for roughly 60 years. Mother Russia had held their hands and now they were asked to lead themselves without a proper educational transitional period to learn how to do so. And things got a little chaotic. Boris Yeltsin took over as the new president of Russia after Gorbachev. And he'd lead Russia from 1991 to 1999, the entirety of the decade that became known as the wild 90s of Russia. Yeltsin was then succeeded by Vladimir Putin, who leads Russia today in what is uh, technically a democracy, even though many see Putin essentially as a dictator. He's led Russia for over 20 years now after winning, quote unquote, his fourth six year term as president. And he'll likely continue to lead for life. Uh, Putin's a subject for another day. We should definitely suck him at some point. Back to Boris in the wild 90s. Now, Yeltsin was given the nearly impossible task of quickly transitioning Russia from a communist nation under state control to a representative democracy under private control. And he'd be heavily criticized for economic mismanagement, massive amounts of corruption occurring under his watch, the rise of Russian oligarchs, incredibly wealthy and crooked Russian business leaders who would end up essentially ruling the nation. Let's talk about these oligarchs for a second the white collar gangsters of the wild 90s. There was all kinds of different uh, types of crime. This is interesting. In late 1992, Yeltsin launched a program of free vouchers as a way to give Russia's mass privatization a jumpstart. Under this program, every Russian citizen was given a voucher worth around 10,000 rubles to be used for the purchase of shares of select state enterprises. And these vouchers quickly ended up in the hands of just a few investors who uh, you know, had cash and they, they, they wanted those vouchers Right? They bought them from people who just needed food in their bellies, who had bills to pay. The vouchers were bought for pennies on the dollar from the poor um, by the people who had the money. And then in 1995, Yeltsin offered stock shares in some of Russia's most valuable state enterprises in exchange for bank loans. The government was essentially selling its assets to raise operating capital. It was in bad shape. And this sale put tons of valuable state assets into the hands of the same people who had bought the vouchers. A small group of tycoons of finance, industry, energy, telecommunications, and the media. By mid-96, you know, a small group of businessmen, these oligarchs, had gobbled up the stock shares and the vouchers, and they controlled most of Russia. Because who initially had cash to take over Russians' businesses and services? Who could buy all the vouchers and stocks? Well, a combination of foreign investors and former communists who've been, you know, making black market money. One of the most famous of these oligarchs is Mikhail Kordakovsky. Mikhail had graduated with a degree in chemical engineering from the Dmitry Mendeleev University of Chemical Technology of Russia in 1986. Uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, or Mendeleev, uh, by the way, was the Russian who came up with the periodic table over 150 years ago. A little trivia. I've heard of it. Uh, Mikhail was the head of this university's chapter of Co uh, Komsomol, a Communist Party Youth League. 
Using party connections, McHale was able to open up a private cafe, his first business, immediately when the new policies allowed it. He had the inside track that this was going to happen due to his Kamasamal connections. Or Kamasamal. Keep wanting to add an extra syllable there. Kamasamal connections. Kind of like insider trading. He was able to act fast because he knew the change was coming. You know, while your average citizen was still in the dark. He had had to scoop. And sources say he, quote, exploited extra legal business opportunities to do so. He was able to take legal loans from Communist Party members, members he most likely bribed. One of his Kamsamal friends was the son of the man who ran the state bank of the USSR. And Mikhail used this connection and various other connections to be one of the first in Russia to somewhat legally import computers, alcohol, and more. You know, he got a big loan to do all this. Obviously, easier to get a big loan if you're friends with the family that runs, you know, the only bank in Russia, uh, you know, when things are kind of changing. After this, another source says he ventured into finance, devising ways to squeeze cash out of the Soviet planned economy. He worked the system. He knew how to take advantage of the chaos. Mikhail and his partners obtained a banking, banking license soon after things changed, uh, supposedly from money make, that he made, you know, selling secondhand computers and most likely uh, money made from a lot of other illicit dealings. And he opened up Bank Menetep in 1989. And this was one of Russia's first privately owned banks. Minitep expanded quickly. Of course it does. You know, it's one of the first banks and people, you know, need banks. And it uses most of the deposits it receives to further finance Kordakovsky's import-export operations, which is fucking genius. I mean, the best way to get loans is to own the bank that's giving you the loans. And that's exactly what he did. He just took out loans, you know, or just gave out loans, whichever way you want to look at it, you know, to himself. Got loans from himself. I I picture a, a young Mikhail applying for a loan at his own bank. And, and just like continually moving back and forth from a seat in front of, you know, a bank president desk to a seat behind it. Just, you know, just walking into a little office. A good day, Mr. Kordakovsky. What can I do for you? Then he just, you know, gets up and sits around on the desk on the other side. Hello, Mr. Kordakovsky. Please call me Mikhail. I would like to loan for 400 million ruble. He walks back around. That is a lot of rubles, Mikhail. Please call me Mikhail as well. This is all money we have, but I, I like you. There's something special about you. I trust you like I trust myself. Of course you have it. This goes back around. That is great news, Mikhail. I will not let you, me down. Let us drink vodka for celebrate. Uh, Mikhail gained a lot of bank capital to loan himself by using his Communist Party connections to get Bank Menetep the right to manage all the funds allocated for the victims of the Chernobyl disaster. That gave him a lot of capital to finance other ventures. Russia would end up dishing out 1.12 billion dollars in Chernobyl compensation. So slowly dispersing all the government. Sorry, you got over-radiated money. While the bulk of it remained in his bank, he was able to make giant purchases. He used some of that Chernobyl money to acquire the Yukos oil company for about $300 million through what was likely a very rigged auction. Yukos would own the rights to a variety of very profitable uh, Siberian oil fields and $300, $300 million was a bargain to buy it. This time I picture him switching back and forth between like being a bidder and an auctioneer. You know, he's, he's the only dude at the auction. And he's the auctioneer. Going once, going twice, sold to me. Oh, wow. I'm so surprised I get it. Thank you, me. Lady luck, shine on me, us. Uh, after this purchase, Kordakovsky goes on a campaign to raise further investment funds abroad, borrowing hundreds of millions in additional money for his new oil company, making billions of dollars. When the 1998 financial crisis strikes Russia, Kordakovsky uh, defaults on a lot of his foreign loans and takes his Yuko shares offshore to protect them from creditors, right? Dude really knew how to work the system. Sorry, foreign money givers. I bankrupt now. I can no pay back. And all the money is gone. <laughs> JK, I fake bankrupt. I got you. I still have many money on the new company name and stuff and sorry and what's not. Tough break for you. What, what do you want me to say for you? It's Russia. They're old saying in Russia. Sometime in Russia, you get fucked. You get fucked over here sometimes. Most of the time, actually. You, you got Russia, <laughs> NBD, OMG, SMH, uh, YOLO. Uh, five years later, 2003, Mikhail would be the wealthiest man in all of Russia, worth over $15 billion. And then later that year, he got cocky. He started to think that all that money gave him the right to do shit like openly criticize Putin, accusing him and other high-ranking Russian politicians of taking millions in bribes. And that didn't work out very well for him. He was suddenly, conveniently, uh, charged with various counts of fraud and quickly sent to prison. New Russia was a lot like old Russia in some ways. Oh man, I I in prison now. This oh, sometime in Russia you do fucking. Sometime you get fucked. Most my, most time you get fucked. I I get Russia to myself. FML NBD at TFO. 
uh, Kordakovsky got out in 2013, left Russia for a few years. Uh, and he's fine, by the way. If you're worried about him, he's, don't, yeah, he's fine. Thanks to stashing a lot of his money abroad in different accounts in different countries under what I assume was different names, he'd walk away with a net worth of around $250 million after all that. So he's not exactly living on beet soup and stale bread. And Mikhail Kordakovsky, just one of many, uh, you know, somewhat like him, one of these, you know, people, intelligent, uh, ambitious, shall we say, morally flexible Russians, meat sacks with the right connections in the right place at the right time. And they swept in and privatized previously state-owned enterprises in the wild 90s, getting them at auctions, other state, you know, sales for pennies on the dollar, making vast fortunes. I mean, that's pretty crazy if like, you know, think about if our country just owned all, all the business were owned by the state. And all of a sudden, the state just was auctioning everything off. Like just, oh, you want all, all, all of computer? It's all for auction now. You get computer sector. <laughs> just like, like, like that rough equivalent. Like if Amazon, you know, is owned by the state and uh, Best Buy and Microsoft and Apple and on and on and Ford and all these different companies were actually owned by the state. And then suddenly, you know, there was this huge fucking fire sale. And if you had, if you could raise the capital, you got to get, you know, a giant corporation for pennies on the dollar. Other Russians, largely operated in the shadows, made fortunes in a variety of other generally illegal ways, while a handful of white-collar criminals were making these vast fortunes. A handful of gang bosses were building huge criminal networks, making fortunes of their own on everything from smuggling in meat and vegetables, other basic goods, without paying, you know, like import taxes and stuff, selling them in underground markets, to uh, selling heroin, assault rifles, and lots of other illegal stuff. Just like, the, just like the oligarchs bribed the new government to look the other way and give them special favors, so did the gangsters. The Russian government is especially corrupt in the 90s. You could bribe just about anyone if you had enough money. And if they wouldn't accept that bribe, in a lot of cases, you could kill them. And the next guy would take the bribe. Uh, and that being said, there were many police officers and politicians who were honorable and not corrupt. Just, just not as many as there needed to be to have any kind of stability in the government. A lot of Russian gangsters made money in the 90s selling illegal arms. I can't tell you how many action movies or TV series I've, I've watched you know, where someone's talking about buying black market Russian guns. And it turns out that reference is not Hollywood nonsense. Very much based in fact. Where did all these Russian guns come from? Well, Gorbachev, uh, again, a little bit. Gorbachev, not, not interested in the Cold War during his tenure as leader in the USSR as the 80s were winding down. He, he pulled troops by the tens of thousands out of Eastern Europe. He would pulled uh, over 100,000 troops out of Afghanistan alone. And he didn't place these troops necessarily anywhere else. He cut the military by 15, 20%. Suddenly there were a, a lot of weapons that weren't being used. And then during the big communist to capitalist transition in the 90s, a lot of these weapons magically disappeared and ended up on the black market. Also, Russia and former Soviet bloc countries had their own military industrial complex just before the fall or complexes, I guess, all these different little bloc countries. There were a number of weapons manufacturers in communist Russia and other former USSR nations who suddenly didn't have the Russian government or the Soviet government to buy up all these weapons that they were making, and many of these manufacturers could now also sell their weapons in ways they couldn't before. Big Brother wasn't looking over their shoulder anymore. They could sell them on the free market, or they could sell them on the black market. A lot of them quickly figured out that they suddenly could make a lot of money you know, selling these weapons to anybody who would want to buy them. There were men like former KGB operative Victor Bout, aka the Merchant of Death, who sold Soviet military-grade weapons all over the world in huge quantities, arming a coup attempt here, a civil war there, a resistance struggle over there, etc. In 2000, the United Nations report stated Bulgarian arms manufacturing companies had exported large quantities of different types of weapons between 1996 and 1998 on the basis of forged end user certificates from Togo and that the company Air Cess, owned by Victor Bout, was the main transporter of these weapons from Bulgaria. So in this case, these weapons were sold to rebels in, the, uh, in West Africa, engaged in a variety of coup attempts and other skirmishes. In addition to weapons, the drug trade and prostitution and sex trafficking trade flourished in 1990s Russia. I first heard the term mail order bride in regards to Russia in the 90s when many Russian women desperate to escape lives of prostitution or just plain old poverty in the hard economic times and the wake of communism's collapse would marry just about any dude in America with a decent job to have a shot at a better life. Uh, check out this quote from a 2008 GQ article called From Russia with Prenup that speaks to this phenomenon. Uh, this is speaking to the end of it, but referencing it in the past, it says, it used to be that almost any dentist or electrical engineer from Scranton or Peoria could fly into Moscow's uh, Cheromatyeva 
airport and 72 hours later emerged with a six foot one supermodel dying to get out of Dodge. Those were the early and mid 90s. In the wake of the 1991 Soviet collapse, when the whole Imperium was falling apart and inflation was out of control and the oligarchs were waging war on each other and all the men were drunks or mobsters and everything seemed to be dying. That was when stunning blonde girls were more than happy to provide borscht and sex in exchange for a townhouse, a minivan, modern appliances, and a husband who was sober most, if not all of the time. Now, obviously, the author of that article took some creative liberties painting that picture, but does paint quite a picture, doesn't it? And it wasn't based on nothing. It was based on a whole bunch of truth. Life in Russia in the wild 90s really was wild. When the super killer was the most active, it was chaotic. This environment allowed him to be what he was. And in the chaos, a new murder-related business flourish, contract killings. In the first four months of 1994, Russia averaged 84 murders per day in a nation of just over 148 million people. In the U.S. in 1994, there were just under 64 murders a day in a nation of a little over 260 million people. Nine murders for every 100,000 people in the U.S. in 1994. Uh, Russia had 32.6 murders for every 100,000 people that year their murder rate almost four times as high as the murder rate in the U.S. And the U.S. murder rate was way higher then than it is today. And today there's still a lot of murders. In 2018, the last year I could easily find data from, the U.S. had five murders for every 100,000 people. In Russia, the rate was almost identical, 4.9 murders per 100,000 people. So for comparison, Russia in 1994 was over six times as murdery as either Russia or the U.S. is right now, and due largely to contract killers like Alexander Solonik. That's a lot of fucking murder. So much murder. With our 24-hour news cycle, it might feel like it's never been more murdery than it is today, but that is absolutely not even close to true. And the high rate of murder again in Russia in the 90s largely attributed to these contract killings. Uh, Some Russian businessmen remember to this day the risks of doing business in the 90s. You were either killed, kidnapped, and tortured, or you had to worry about the safety of your family and loved ones. Most of these contract killings were paid for by the Russian mafia, various organized crime gangs that flourished in the 90s. Uh, One businessman, Valery Loktinov, recently recalled, in the 90s, everything turned upside down. The country had become divided into two camps, the hunters and the prey. Businessmen were the prey and gangsters were the hunters. Because the law didn't work. It was the criminal leaders who were the main source of power. People came to them willingly seeking help, and so did businessmen to seek protection. If you secured protection from a good gang, then you didn't have to worry much. Ha. Sounds like so much fun, doesn't it? Oh, Russia, what a place to live. Yay. And I'm sure it's fun for a lot of people now, but man, a lot of Russia is gorgeous. But Jesus Christ, doesn't sound like it was super fun for a lot of people in the 90s. And this this was when things were, you know, uh, getting better out of communism. In in some ways, and it was still like just a fucking shit show. Uh, In the wild 90s, Russia verged uh, at times on the edge of anarchy and collapse. Laws in many places were almost meaningless. Might made right. Wealth walked hand in hand with death. A free for all market, an explosion of uh, a free for all. Let me restart that sentence. A free for all market, an explosion of professional gangsters, a massive rise in low level thugs, a surge of martial arts gyms, massive uncontrolled black markets, and so many scams were the main contributors to the criminal chaos of 90s Russia. Let's talk about each of these six components for a moment here before we talk a little bit more about uh, Russian gangs and then we go into the life of Alexander Solonik. I I love these contextual details. Learning shit! (laughs) Yeah, yeah! Uh, Let's start by looking at the free-for-all free market. Starting your own business or owning an enterprise, you know, again, was illegal in the Soviet Union prior to Gorbachev's reforms. But in communist Russia, if you wanted something bad enough and you had the money, you were able to definitely get it. There was a black market, not just for major vices, but for basic goods. Those who tried to sell basic items, you know, brought in from foreign visitors prior to the Iron Curtain's fall were called spivs. They traded in anything, from jeans to vinyl records, beauty products to U.S. dollars, illegally selling a wide variety of goods that were in short supply behind the Iron Curtain. These merchants were uh, like drug dealers, but instead of selling drugs, they sold shit that you or me would just go pick up at CVS or Walgreens or 7-Eleven or, you know, Target, Barnes & Noble, that kind of place. How odd. I picture some dude in an alley just wearing a trench coat. Oh, you want boys to men CD? I could get you CD. You want no fear t-shirt? I can, I get you that. You want dye free Tide laundry detergent, canned dog food, yo-yo, Chia Pet? I, get you, I can get you Chia Pet. I, I your guy. 
uh, with the collapse of the USSR in 1991, Spivs no longer had to sell in the shadows. And they became Russia's new class of entrepreneurs, which is hilarious to me that the only people in Russia with any real capitalistic, you know, business entrepreneurial experience when the transition happened were, were technically criminals. Russians who were selling shit on the sly were the only Russians who had real experience as business owners. And since these entrepreneurs were already comfortable with breaking the law, many of them didn't mind to continue to break laws in Russia's new era of capitalism, which leads me uh, to talk about the rise of Russian professional gangsters. The 90s saw crime skyrocket as brigades of thugs patronized cafes, outdoor markets, and small businesses of all kinds. Many of Russia's gangs had a hierarchy you know, that they strictly adhered to. They were often well-connected, often sharing their illegal earnings and powerful former, uh, and with powerful, excuse me, former communists still working in state agencies. The image of a Russian gangster dressed in a black leather jacket remains one of the most enduring symbols of 90s Russia. In, er in, er yeah, in early 1993, the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs reported there were over 5,000 organized crime groups operating in Russia alone, not counting the other you know, former Soviet bloc nations. These groups were comprised of an estimated 100,000 members with leadership comprised of around 18,000. And then there were hundreds of thousands of additional people working for these gangs in some kind of limited capacity. More on these gangs, their structure and operational methods in a moment after we get to these six components. These new gangsters running drugs, girls, guns, or whatever, they made a lot of money. They drove fancy cars, ate the finest food, lived in big new homes or penthouses. And they did, and they did all of this while Russia's overall economy tanked. From about 1991 to 1998, Russia lost nearly 30% of its gross domestic product suffering through numerous bouts of inflation that decimated the savings of the average Russian citizen. Russians saw their disposable incomes rapidly decline throughout the 90s. So it's probably not surprising that many a poor Russian kid looked up to these gangsters. Kids who wanted to eat steak and drive a Porsche instead of uh, eating beef stroganoff, and catching the bus. The image of a mighty feared and respected gangster was of course very appealing to these troubled youths, many of whom were emerging from shitty childhoods, raised by confused parents, struggling to comprehend and navigate their new Russian free way of life. And many of these youths became what is what were known, what are still known as Gopniks. Gopnik is a young male thug typically dressed in an Adidas tracksuit. I'm not making up that last detail. I'll explain that. Like if you went to a Halloween party dressed up as a Russian gangster, odds are you would be dressing up as a Gopnik. And why did they wear Adidas, by the way? What's up with the Adidas tracksuits? Because in the late 80s and the early 90s, when communism was falling, knockoff Adidas tracksuits and shoes were the most common cheap tracksuits you could easily buy in Russia. And they became a uniform of sorts for young Russian and Eastern Bloc nation thugs. And once that look was established, later Gopniks wore Adidas, even if it was cheaper to buy other knockoffs or whatever, because they wanted to look like the OG Gopniks. That OG look, while not as popular as it was in the 90s, remains, you know, uh, you know, you, you could find it in parts of Russia and the other, other parts of the Eastern Bloc to this day. And I love little odd nut, knowledge nuggets like that, that that's where that comes from. Cause that's what I think of when I think of like a Halloween costume, for like a Russian gangster, just the, the wife beater, you know, the tracksuit, the, the little hat I'm going to talk about in a second, the gold chain. A lot of these Gopniks were living in these giant, sad, concrete, soulless apartment high rises, other multi-story, low cost, concrete paneled apartment buildings called Khrushchevkas or uh, Khrushchevkas. Khrushchevkas, there we go. They were built all over Russia to house workers in numerous communist factories in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when more and more Russians were moving from agricultural rural areas to the cities to work in Soviet industrial centers. And these buildings, these slums, really, these projects, they were super cheap to live in, low-income housing. And when the black market exploded in the 90s, these buildings were filled with young men who wanted to be gangsters. But maybe they didn't have the drive or motivation or connections or business sense to really make a lot of money doing anything illicit or otherwise. And many of them didn't become like, you know, real hardcore full-time gangsters in the sense that Alexander Solonik was. They became th petty thugs, sometimes hired by real gangsters for like low-level jobs. You know, they were guys who burglarized or carjacked or shoplifted or tried to shake down business owners until real gangsters moved in and, you know, scared them off or killed them. And they wore these Adidas tracksuits. They got fucked up on cheap vodka, chain smoked, wore these flat Kangle type hats, basically just disponed their parents and made life tough for any non-Gopniks Gopniks around them. Now, I, I love the Wikipedia description of Gopniks. It says, Gopniks are often associated with cheap alcohol, such as low-quality vodka and light beer, cheap cigarettes, low-end mobile devices, and sometimes even firearms. They also utilize common Russian profanities and often behave rudely. 
<laughs> Gopniks often drive older BMWs as their primary means of transport. I love this description. Low-end mobile devices behaving rudely. Paints quite a picture. Victor, why can't you get real job? Why must you be Gopnik? Why, why do you use shit flip phone? Hang out all day in front of building. Get, get drunk on cheap vodka. Say bad things for people. You not know me. You not know me, father. I hard ass OG. I Wu Tang. I NWA Wu Tang vanilla ice baby rolled in one Russia tough guy body. I slang in the rocks, pops. I ate to fucking K, homeboy. I live in that life. What you know? You not wear this cool guy track pants suit jacket thing. You square. I, I Huey Lewis. I too hip for square. I listen. I not. Okay, I'm pretty drunk right now. I, I don't remember. What's the point I'm making? I, I lost track of things. Huey Lewis. Uh, Gopniks were essentially douchebags. <laughs> There's a lot of them. 90s Russia was fucking flooded with douchebags. Flooded with cheap tracksuit, wife beating, or wife beater, you know, flat, flat hat, gold chain wearing, vodka chugging, parent disappointing, up to no good, petty criminal douchebags. Sounds like an awesome place. What is big deal with Gopniks? Why Sakmaster make fun of strong Russian youth? Whose only fault is have to live with no communism, no douchebag, capitalism, and make a limp like a Chikatilo's shamecock. They bother no one, just like me, just like Chikatilo, jerk and corner. And they bother no, well, okay, maybe they bother a lot of people. I forget the point I also trying to make. I, I just, I don't like shit talk of Gopniks by American filth. I knew Chikatilo would have to show up this week. How could that Russian serial killing dirty bird not at least make a cameo? Uh, apparently, a favorite line of the Gopnik thugs in the 90s was, any loose change, what happens if I search you and find some? And they'd say that right before shaking down fellow tenants, you know, who were usually like senior citizens or, you know, anyone they thought they could easily intimidate. Uh, Vasily, 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 there we go, Vasily Sotnikov, who was a teen growing up in Russia in the 90s, remembers the Gopniks saying, in the 90s, Gopniks used to squat in public places and track down nonconformist teenagers. Once I bumped into them, they grabbed me by my long hair and smashed me against an intercom. This was this innocent pastime we had back then. That's his, that's his quote. I love when Russia is translated into English. It never just quite is, is, is fluid. <laughs> doesn't, come, doesn't, doesn't work out well in the translation. Now let's talk about randomly Russia's 90s MMA gyms and how they fed into the wild 90s that Solonek would be a part of, how they would lead to many a hitman. Karate gyms seemingly sprung up like mushrooms in every vacant Russian 90s basement. Taekwondo, Thai boxing, also very popular. Sweep the leg, Johnny! Mercius for the week! Yes, comrade! In many cases, these gyms were less about sports and self-defense, and they were more about providing a place for Gopniks and other local youth to prove to local gangs that they could work as muscle. Gangs often ran these gyms, owned them, and if some young dude showed promise as an ass whooper, he was recruited and given some violent assignments. And if he was real good at beating down other Russians, he could end up working as a contract killer as a hitman. All right, now let's go over Russia's 90s massive black markets. Not the black market, not the concept of underground commerce in general. I'm talking about actual markets where you go to buy a wide variety of illegal goods. When authorities finally closed the legendary uh, Cherkiovsky market in 2009, a stadium sized market in Moscow. Picture a huge market employing over 100,000 people at its height. They discovered underground workrooms and flop houses, an underground city existed beneath the market. It's pretty wild. I watched some news footage of reporters exploring it. No one really knows how much illegal and unaccounted goods and trafficked people spread through this market into and out of Russia since it opened sometime around 1990, but experts estimated that Russia's state budget was losing billions of U.S. dollars annually to this and other similar markets. Needless to say, this place was a criminal hotbed in 90s Moscow when gangsters protected traders and controlled the massive flow of illegal goods into and out of the capital. Anita Lebeveda, who was a kid in Moscow in the 1990s, remembers her visits to the market where she saw hundreds of aisles filled with goods, most of which were sold on a questionable or you know, questionably legal basis. She said, every time I came to uh, Cherkiovsky Market, I saw kilometers of clothes, shoes, lingerie, mixed with lines, trading in food, mostly kebabs, which were exotic in Moscow at the time. Customers had no chance to try clothes on gracefully. In winter, we tried on boots standing on a piece of cardboard. In summer, we tried on swimwear covered by a seller or another customer. Man, I thought U.S. Uh, flea markets were shitty. I've been to many a flea market, wore a lot of flea market t-shirts in my youth. 
Uh, I don't remember ever seeing people trying on swimsuits out in the aisles. Unfortunately, hail Lucifina. Now for one more primary ingredient that created Russia's wild 90s scam artists. As if, the, if the, as if the average Russian citizen didn't have enough shit to deal with. There was so many scams in the 90s. It's full of scams. Uh, everything from your basic telemarketing scam to pyramid scams and religious cults. Millions of Russians were tricked into investing in Sergei Mavradi's infamous financial pyramid, uh, MMM, a fraudulent investment company considered to be the largest Ponzi scheme of all time. And a Ponzi scheme, since we haven't talked about one in a while here on The Suck, it's a form of fraud that lures investors and pays profits to earlier investors with funds from more recent investors. So let me give you a crude example of how a Ponzi scheme can work. All right, you get Joe, Bob, Tina, Jamal, Rosario, whoever, to buy in at $1,000 each. And you promise to double their money in 30 days. You have some fake investment company. And you're going you know, to double their money in 30 days under the guise of being a shrewd investor, and having a special talent for making a killing in you know, real estate speculation, the stock market, whatever. It doesn't matter. Any kind of investment. During those 30 days, you hope to get a whole bunch more of other people, Doug, Pedro, Chang, Jimmy Dean, whoever, to also give you a thousand bucks to keep the math simple. And then when the first day, first, first 30 day period is up, let, let's say uh, Tina wants her, her 2000 that you promised, right? You're going to double her thousand. Well, you give that to her, you give her $2,000 and she thinks that $2,000 came from incredible investing on your part, but it didn't because you're not investing shit. You, you gave her Chang's thousand dollars plus Doug's a thousand dollars. And you hope that Tina tells a lot of her friends how amazing you are. And then they all give you $1,000 each. And then Tina maybe gives you more money because she knows it works. And it just keeps going on like that in some fashion. And if the government doesn't intervene first, the Ponzi scheme generally, you know, usually collapses when more people are asking for their big returns than the con artists running the scam have stashed away or are, you know, continuing to take in or willing to dish back out, right? And this is a very simplistic version I just laid out. I mean, the Ponzi collector could invest your money but they're, but they're not investing it in what they're telling you it's being invested in at the very least. Otherwise, if they lost your money, it wouldn't be because they were a con artist. It would just be because they were a, a legal, shitty investor. Well, with the help of an aggressive TV commercial and infomercial ad campaign that ran in 1994, Sergey Mavradi's particular MMM Ponzi scheme wiped out the life savings, this is crazy to me, of an estimated 5 to 10 million Russians in 1994. This one motherfucker wiped out five to 10 million people's savings accounts. Oh, and I want, and I want to get, I want you guys to hear you meet sacks to hear two of the commercials for this scheme. There was a ton of them made. They're so awesomely nineties Russian. Thank you. YouTube for providing this and, and for providing an English caption service so I can understand and translate. So, so here, here we go. Here's a two really quick of these MMM investing little commercials. And it would probably help if I remembered to turn the, the captions are. It says, these are the new boots. Well, would you look at that? A new fur coat, a, a new fur coat. Here's Rita and Lenya. Lady sitting in her chair. Now there's a guy with a graph. Now I finally know what we're going to do with our money. We're going to invest all of it in MMM shares. And there's this guy just pointed at this graph of just showing like your money ramping up. You're going to buy, you know, they're going to invest it in boots and a coat and, and all this other stuff. And then he says, it already gave us chance to buy the boots, the fur coats. Oh, this is the person uh, making the money. In May, we'll buy some new furniture. In June, a new car. Oh, everything is going right up, straight to the top. This guy's dressed awesome, by the way. The, the main presenter is just dressed in the cheapest, shittiest brown suit I've ever seen. It's fucking great. And then Rita, this lady sitting in the chair goes, I want the house in Paris. And then the guy who was pointing at the chart showing how everything's getting better goes, and why not, Lenya? Uh, we'll invest in MMM. And then there's another one. There's these two dudes. Okay, this is so stereotypically Russian, like a caricature. <laughs> two dudes and wife beaters sitting in a fucking shitty apartment, just getting hammered on vodka. And the presenter... What he says here first is, this is Lenya Goblikov, and that is his older brother, Ivan, from Vrkuta. <laughs> older brother Ivan has the thickest Russian uh, mustache. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> he says, Lenya, you're a Kalashasik and a slacker. Don't you remember that our parents taught us to work as honest men? 
He says, and here you are running around buying some fancy shares. You're a Kolyevshik, uh, which roughly translates to freeloader. And then Lenny says, no, you're right. No, he says, no, you're not right, brother. I ain't no Kolyevshik. I earn my money fair and square working on an excavator. <laughs> All the music. Also, in addition to just uh, drinking vodka, like straight vodka, uh, they're eating just pickles out of a jar. And he says, and then I invest this money in shares that bring me profit. Let's say you decided to build a factory. He says, you won't be able to build it alone, that's for sure. But if we all invest in it, we'll be able to build a factory that will feed us and bring profits. His brother's not buying it. And he says, I'm not a Kolyovshik. I'm not a freeloader. I'm a partner. And then, the, and then the presenter says, sure thing, Lenya, we're partners. MMM. Well, you know what? Lenya should have fucking listened to Ivan and not bought the stupid fancy shares. You fucking, you fucking call you shit. Uh, the MMM, each M representing the first letter in the last name of all three original scheme creators, Mavradi uh, being one of them. Uh, he had two lesser partners. When it was launched in February, 1994, it promised annual returns of up to 3,000% making me think immediately of that famous saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And also, a fool and his money are soon parted. If someone tells you that they can give you for sure an annual return, an annual return of around $3,000, go ahead and kick them in their dick or vagina as hard as you can. They for sure deserve it. They're definitely hustling you. 7 10% is a phenomenal annual return, right? That's a realistic return rate in, in a decent economy. 3,000%? Get the fuck out of here. At its peak, MMM was taking in millions of dollars a day from its sale of fake-ass shares. On July 22nd, 1994, just five months after this fake company launch, uh, Russia's Ministry of Finance issued a statement listing MMM among a number of investment firms illegally uh, issuing unregistered securities. Thousands and thousands of investors staged a mass protest in front of the company headquarters in Moscow, pr prompting the intervention of riot police. People threatened to light themselves on fire. They were hysterical. They had just lost everything. It was, it was an intense scene. The next day, MMM is gone, and then it would just pop up soon under a different name and then operate under another name and another name and another name for years. And almost all of the initial investors had their money stolen from them, completely gone, wiped out. And what's really crazy is that Russia didn't have laws against Ponzi schemes at the time. And Sergei Mavradi was never held accountable. He was charged with tax evasion. That was the best they could do. And then he said that the government took everyone's money, not him. And, and, and if he could stay out of jail, he could get everyone's money back. And then he ran a campaign to be elected to Russia's state Duma, the lower house of the Federal Assembly of Russia, kind of like being a, a Congress member in the US. And he fucking won. They believed him and he won. And being a member of the state Duma made it illegal for the government to prosecute him for tax evasion. So he was never charged with that. And then, of course, he never got anybody their money. He was finally arrested again for more fraud in 2003, served four years in prison. After getting out, he ran the same scam, the same MMM Ponzi scheme scam in India and China and a variety of other developing African and Asian nations, promising shit, you know, like his fucking crazy returns, 30% and more returns, robbed a whole uh, bunch more people, got away with it all over again, finally died of heart problems in 2018. To me, a man like Sergei Mavrade, every bit as bad as a serial killer like Andre Chikatilo, if not worse. He may not be cutting up anybody, but he is uh, you know, pushing a lot of people to commit suicide after knowingly murdering the financial futures of them and their families. Surprisingly, none of his MMM Ponzi schemes had anything to do with the real Triple M, Michael motherfucking McDonald. What a fool believes he sees. The wise man has power boom, 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 to reason away. Uh, almost sounds like Triple M was singing that song about Ponzi schemes. Uh, there were a lot of other schemes floating around Russia in the wild 90s. So, uh, so now we have a, a better feel for what kind of criminal activity was going on in Russia, just in general in the 90s. And now that we do, let's take a deeper look into organized crime in Russia before jumping into the life of super killer Alexander Solonik because... You know, he, he did all of his hits, of course, as a hitman for organized crime members. Organized crime was the life he lived in. 
or he was involved in. So let's take a look at the Russian mafia. The Russian mafia is sometimes referred to as bratva, meaning brotherhood. Important to note that the Russian mafia, not even close to one giant criminal organization with one leader. Uh, it's a collective of a lot of various organized crime groups of various sizes and organizational levels originating in the former Soviet Union. It's really just a cool way to refer to a lot of various Russian gangs, right? It's cooler to say Russian mafia than it is to say one of many Russian-based, you know, criminal organizations of varying degrees of sophistic you know, sophistication. Uh, organized crime had existed in Russia since before the Bolsheviks showed up. It goes back to the pre-communist czars. After the Bolsheviks showed up, organized crime became more organized during the reign of Lenin and Stalin. Uh, they had to be more organized to survive and not get tortured and killed. When communist secret police and parent, you know, in the in the paranoid atmosphere that existed in Stalinist Russia, where neighbors were strongly encouraged to spy on their neighbors, and criminals really had to work hard to hide their criminal activity in communist Russia, because of how repressive things were and how few goods were available to the average comrade, there was a huge market for crime, and a lot of these gangsters' customers were members of the Communist Party themselves, and they wanted fancy whiskey from Scotland or Parisian lingerie or, you know, a vinyl record from the U.S. or whatever. And they couldn't get it legally, so they'd get it from some various gang, you know, or, you know, part of the Russian mafia. Uh, during the Soviet area, the most hardcore gangsters, men who would start the gangs that would become the most powerful and the biggest in Russia, were known as thieves-in-law, as in these thieves were in charge. They dished out punishment for those who didn't obey them. They were the law. Uh, and they emerged out of Stalin's gulags, gaining power in horrible and corrupt and harsh labor camps like they were, you know, some kind of fucking Russian bane or some shit. If you're non-comic book nerds, that's the Batman villain born in a South American prison in the DC universe. Grow stronger from the pain. Don't let it destroy you. Uh, in Russia's harshest prisons, criminal leaders emerged who ran a variety of illicit rackets while incarcerated and then later ran things outside when they got out. In the gulags, criminal honor code and a more defined hierarchy emerged that helped these gangs stand out from their peers when communism collapsed. Various large gangs emerged groups so powerful that in the first years following communism's fall, some estimate they controlled as much as two-thirds of the entire Russian economy. That's insane if true. Two-thirds of the nation's economy controlled by gangs. Louis Free, former director of the FBI from 1993 to 2001 in the United States, said that the Russian mafia posed the greatest threat to global security in the mid-90s. You know, the greatest threats, you know, to America and to the, to the rest of the world was Russian mafia. He's more worried about them than any single nation in the mid nineties. So let's check out exactly how some of these Russian mafia groups were structured in a traditional Russian mafia gang. There's the boss, right? The top dog, the boss controls an average of around four criminal cells through an intermediary uh, called a brigadier, a captain, similar to capo in an Italian American mafia crime family. The brigadier dishes out jobs. The boss generally employs a couple spies to keep an eye on his brigadier, make sure that the brigadier stays loyal, make sure he doesn't get too ambitious and try something stupid like killing his way into a promotion. Then there's the Pratok. The Pratok, uh, they, they work under the brigadier, usually running lead on various criminal activities, similar to soldiers in the Sicilian mafia. Pratok's also known as Boyeviks, a word that literally means warrior. Boyevik, uh, they're, in, Boyeviks, they're in charge of finding new guys, paying tributes uh, up to their brigadier. Uh, each criminal cell overseen by a brigadier would specialize in a specific type of criminal activity, you know, like drugs, prostitution, weapons, whatever. And Russian law enforcement officials indicate that most of these organized crime groups conducted their business with sophisticated technical equipment, computers, transportation, financial support, uh, counterintelligence network. In addition to drugs, prostitution, and guns, there were cells specializing in extortion, precious metal, raw material smuggling, money laundering, fraud, other black market horseshittery, including election tampering. Right? There's still a lot of these gangs around now. Uh, each cell has enforces, enforcers excuse me, and associations with hitmen. Each cell has a leader and a security team of enforcers and a lower tier of gang members who oversee the actual criminal activity being committed by street operators. Street operators kept in the dark as far as who the boss is, as far as who the brigadier is. They generally never deal with anyone higher than a Boyevik. And the real hardcore Russian mafia gangs, the ones derived from the gulags, some of them still follow an old school thieves code of ethics. This is a traditional code of conduct formulated by uh, uh, those, you know, those original gulag thieves and laws. These hardcore gangsters, you know, uh, they were gangsters for life and they, they bound themselves by 18 codes. And if any of those codes were broken, the punishment would be death. It says, here's the 18 codes. Members must, one, forsake his relatives, mother, father, brothers, sisters. 
Two, not have a family of his own, no wife, no children. This does not, however, preclude him from having a lover. Number three, never under any circumstances work, no matter how much difficulty this brings, live only on means gleaned from thievery. Four, help other thieves, both by moral and material support, utilize the, commun the community of thieves. Five, keep secret information about the whereabouts of accomplices, dens, district hide hideouts, safe apartments, etc. You know, keep it all secret. Six, in, in unavoidable situations, take the blame for someone else's crimes. Yeah, for someone else's crimes. Seven, demand a convocation of inquiry for the purpose of resolving disputes in the event of a conflict between oneself and other thieves or between thieves. Eight, if necessary, participate in such inquiries. Nine, carry out the punishment of the offending thief as decided by the convocation. Ten, not resist carrying out the decision of punishing the offending thief who is found guilty with punishment determined by the convocation. Eleven, have good command of the thieves' jargon. Funny, right? Not get another fucking language, right? Know the slang. Twelve, not gamble without being able to cover losses. All right. Thirteen, teach the trade to young beginners. Fourteen, have if possible informants from the rank and file of thieves. Fifteen, not lose your reasoning ability when using alcohol. Sixteen, have nothing to do with authorities. Never participate in public activities or join any community organizations, right? Stay, keep a low profile. 17, never take weapons from the hands of authorities. Never serve in the military. 18, make good on promises given to other thieves. All right, so that's the, that's, that's the code there. Now, to be clear, most Russian gang members don't follow it. But there, but there you know, are some that do. And there were more that did in the 90s. Hardcore motherfuckers in and out of the gulags and subsequent labor camps and maximum security prisons that followed, you know, these rules. Men who resigned themselves to never have families, never lead a straight life. Like a priest committed to the church, these guys gave their lives to the gang till death. These are the guys, you know, you know, you, you, you probably, you know, you, it seemed like covered in Russian prison tattoos. If you've seen those images online, and we'll talk about those tattoos in a moment. Many of these guys ran the biggest Russian gangs. You know, these were the most hardcore, scary Russian gangsters. Some of these Russian gangs made their way to the U.S. and elsewhere outside of Russia, uh, a, large, a lot of them in the 90s. According to intelligence reports, members of some criminal groups in Russia were often sent in the 90s to reinforce and consolidate links between groups in Russia and the U.S. Russian organized crime figures also sent to the U.S. to perform services such as gangland murders or extortion. There was one guy, uh, Vasheslav Ivankov, a Russian organized crime leader, traveled to the U.S. to organize Russian mafia groups and linked them to groups still in Russia, a uh, thief in law, and he was arrested in Brooklyn, New York, June 8th, 1995, for trying to extort three and a half million dollars from a Wall Street investment firm. He was deported back to Russia in 2004 to face a couple murder charges for killing two Turkish men in broad daylight in a Moscow restaurant in 92. Wild 90s. Walking into restaurants and shooting motherfuckers in their faces. At his uh, trial, eyewitnesses who were at the restaurant, including a police officer who was at the restaurant when he killed a couple people, suddenly couldn't remember ever seeing him. And he was walked away a free man. It's weird. Uh, these gangsters terrified people. And they paid the people they didn't scare. And then in 2009, a sniper took Ivankov out as he left another Moscow restaurant when he was 69 years old. Almost 70, and he died a gangster's death. Uh, the sniper, thought to have been a contract killer, a man hired by a rival gang leader. Russian gangsters even made it to where I lived in the late 90s, Spokane, Washington, 30 minutes from where I'm recording this today. Approximately 600 to 800 Russian mafia figures thought to live in L.A. in the 90s. Hundreds more lived in Northern California, generally working in car theft rings. They bounced from San Francisco and Sacramento to Oregon, eventually made it to Washington State, specializing in auto theft and, you know, VIN number switching. You know, young members of the group of Russian gangsters would steal vehicles while older members would operate body shops, chop them up, sell the parts. They utilized Interstate uh, I-5 to travel to Oregon and Washington and sell stolen vehicle parts to other Russian and Ukrainian criminals. They also got involved in extortion, cell phone fraud, prostitution, trafficking in narcotics, uh, firearms, you know, illegal dealing. Between 1990 and 2000 in Spokane, Washington, where I was going to school from 95 to 99 at Gonzaga, the Slavic population increased from about 1,000 people to about 5,000, mainly Russian and Ukrainian. And thousands of additional immigrants thought to have moved to Spokane uh, from other former Soviet bloc nations. The census only provided boxes to check for Russians and Ukrainians. Any other Eastern European people were just lumped into other. Also believed a lot of Russians lied on the census, afraid to reveal their true heritage and inclined to hide it after growing up in communist Russia. And with this influx of Russians, most of whom I should emphasize are law-abiding citizens and were, came an influx of organized Russian mafia crime as well. 
Spokane has had an incredibly high car theft rate for years, and it began to spike in the 90s. I heard about it when I went to school. Uh, it's, it's still high. Four years ago in 2016, when the most recent data I could find, cars were stolen at a rate of 931 vehicles a year per 100,000 people in Spokane. Uh, that rate is higher than Portland, Oregon's rate of si 767 per 100,000. And Portland had the third highest car theft rate out of any major city in the U.S. in 2016. Detroit led the nation with 1330 per 100,000, if you're curious. So still, still some... Uh, Supposed Russian mafia car theft activity going around where I live. But now we're getting too far away for the name of this episode, right? Alexander Solonik. Just want to establish all this, this crazy depths of all this crime that was going on around him. Uh, just going to talk about infamous Russian prison tattoos. A big part of the Russian mafia culture Solonik was a part of. Th then we'll hit today's timeline and stay on Solonik for the rest of the suck. Uh, from the mid-60s to the 80s, approximately 35 million people were incarcerated in Soviet prisons. And approximately 28 to 30 million Russian, uh, in, uh, you know, of those inmates were tattooed. So 35 million people in, uh, you know, Soviet prisons, 28 to 30 million of them tattooed. And a lot of those tattoos weren't just for funsies. They weren't butterflies on lower backs. They weren't barbed wire around biceps. According to criminologist Akrady G. Bronikov, who has studied tattoos of Russian prisoners for 30 years, inmates wear tattoos only after they've committed certain crimes. The more, you know, convictions a criminal has received, uh, the more incarceration, you know, that they've suffered, the more tattoos they'll have. Various tattoos represent various types of crime. They represent allegiances to various gangs and the rank one has in those gangs. You know, these tattoos have a meaning or have meanings, you know, far beyond just body art. According to uh, Bronikov, the tattoos spell out the criminal lives of those who wear them. And it establishes a hierarchy amongst inmates in prison. Inside prison, the tattoos help other prisoners identify who's a boss, who's a soldier, who's an enforcer. You know, those are the guys in the top two tiers of prison hierarchy life. Then there are the, the, the prisoners who may be hard men, but aren't gangsters. They make up the third tier. And then there's the lowest tier is these outcasts, men who are basically slaves to the top two tiers of men. And you can tell who's in what tier by what kind of tattoos they have. Uh, you know, the, 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 more, the more you know about these tattoos, the more quickly you're able to identify who's, who's doing what, who you shouldn't fuck with. Prisoners trying to bump up a level by faking it, by giving themselves some fake bad boy tattoos. Uh, often severely punished by fellow inmates, you know, either given a, like a crude cover-up tattoo, otherwise maimed, or oftentimes killed. Now let's talk about a man who got some of these tattoos while in prison in Russia, Alexander Solonik, a.k.a. Alexander the Great, a.k.a. Sasha, the Macedonian, a.k.a. the super killer. A man who's probably Russia's most infamous hitman, credited with almost superhuman abilities, marksmanship, reckless fearlessness, incredible luck, a man whose exploits inspired two Russian films, nine Russian TV series, three books, several Russian documentaries. And documentaries. The man who stood out perhaps more than any other person in Russia's wild 90s for being a feared criminal. Essentially, if you're familiar with the film franchise uh, John Wick, if you've seen any John Wick movies, this, this dude was like a real-life John Wick. So much so that I, that I have to think that John Wick was based, like that character, the initial comic character based somewhat after Alexander Solonik or the legends around Solonik. John Wick, a contract killer, feared and respected by other contract killers, a man shrouded in myth. Uh, so let's get to know everything we can about this real John Wick in today's Time Suck timeline, right after a quick word from the sponsors that help us bring the show to you every week. Thank you again for using our discount codes and our landing pages, you know, our, our URLs, when you take advantage of these offers. Now we get to know Rush's super killer. A man who uh, might even make Bojangles a little bit nervous. Not that our, you know, fearless pit bull mascot would ever admit that. And reminder, if some of the stories about this dude seem pretty over the top, they might be. It is almost impossible to know where the truth ends and myth begins with this guy's life, uh, which I like. You know, he's like a real life boogeyman. You don't know how, how bad he, we know he's bad. We don't know exactly how bad he was. Let's get to it. Hail Nimrod. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Alexander Viktorovich Solonik, born in Korgan, Russia, October 16th, 1960. Uh, Korgan, a city of roughly 300,000 people at the time, just over 2,000 kilometers, just over 1,200 miles east of Moscow. 27 hour drive if you don't stop. Uh, Kurgan, located in the mountainous Urals region of Russia on the southwestern edge of Siberia, lying on the banks of the Tobol River and on the Trans-Siberian you know, uh, Railroad Line near the border with Kazakhstan. 
And when the city was established in the mid 17th century, it was set up as a defensive fortress to guard the eastern edge of the Russian Empire from foreign invaders attacking from Siberia and elsewhere. Randomly, currently home to the Russian uh, Ilzarov Scientific Center for Restorative Traumatology and Orthopedics, supposedly the largest medical institution in the world specializing in the treatment of complex orthopedic problems. And I just think that's uh, pretty ironic. A Russian man known primarily around the world for his ability to kill and break other people's bones, born in a Russian city, mostly known for repairing bones. It was a negative 17 degrees Celsius, roughly zero degrees Fahrenheit, the day Alexander was born. And he cried his first tears in the, in the world as he entered the world in a Korgan hospital delivery room. He was born to Nikolai and Eleonora Solonik, two Korgan natives. His father worked as a house painter. His mom was a gymnastics teacher. And Alexander seems to have had a pretty typical early childhood. Went to school, didn't get in too much trouble, played a variety of different sports. Uh, did really well in his classes. He, he loved to read, loved to learn. Often known to finish his assignments first. And while he was waiting for his little buddies to catch up, he'd, he'd listen to his teacher give lessons to children in the class above him who were being taught in the same room. Young Alexander, sharp mind, good kid. On weekends, his parents often took him to lakes and parks around the city or to visit his two sets of grandparents. Alexander would quickly become known primarily by the nickname of Sasha and uh, was also known to be calm, introverted, and pretty shy. And if you can believe all the stories, he was super athletic when it came to combat sports. He first excelled in wrestling, able to consistently pin his classmates. Then he started kicking a lot of ass in various martial arts like judo. In 1976, I know we skipped ahead quite a bit there. Not a lot known about his early childhood. 1976, the age of 16, uh, Sasha gets his judo black belt. Also somewhere around the age of 16, he kicked a lot of ass in boxing, becoming an inter-school boxing champion. And he was fucking kids up in a karate class. He started taking karate back around 1974. I think his mom's genetics and, and, and teaching helped him out with all this. I mean, she was a gymnastics teacher, after all. Well, none of the sources say she trained him in gymnastics or that he you know, took a lot of gymnastics. I have to think he probably was doing some tumbling as a wee tyke, gaining you know, some above-average body control, balance, and core strength. Sasha studied the uh, Wadurayo method of karate. Probably saying that wrong. I, I tried. Uh, the school of the way of peace, the school of the way of harmony, but he wouldn't use karate for peace or harmony. Not at all. Sasha trained every week of the school year, twice a week, taking karate. Less than four years, he got his first karate black belt at the age of 18 in 1978. Sasha was the best martial artist in his dojo. Of course he was. And in 78, he began to compete in karate tournaments, winning a bunch of local you know, tournaments, winning a regional competition, getting an invitation to uh, fight in a national competition that he never fought in because he decided to no longer pursue karate tournaments and he joined the military instead. So to recap, by the, by the time you know, Sasha turns 18, no other kid his own age uh, you know, in this tough Russian city of 300,000 people can hang with him in the boxing ring and he beats everyone's ass in wrestling and he has a judo black belt and he can fuck up everyone, not just in his city, but in the, in the whole region on the karate mat and, and possibly everyone in the whole nation. You know, he never went to that national tournament. Gosh, you know, re just kind of laying all this out there. I just sometimes I have these moments. I'm like, am I talking about a Russian super killer or am I talking about myself? You fucking heard me. 1995. All right, check out these stats. 95, I was arguably the best Taekwondo martial artist in Riggins, Idaho. After taking lessons for three months in McCall, Idaho, because to my knowledge, no one else in Riggins had ever taken Taekwondo lessons. So, odds are, I was probably the best, you know? I never took boxing lessons, but I did do some backyard, backyard boxing. I went with my friends, we put on the gloves, and we had a little makeshift tournament, and there was like six of us, and I'm pretty sure I finished uh, second to last, you know, which is better than last. I may have finished last, but I didn't cry. I know that. I didn't cry after taking a lot of ass whoopings. And that's tough. So you know what? Okay. I'm the, I was probably the opposite. I was probably the opposite of Alexander Sasha Solonik. Uh, I get it. He was very tough. Uh, he was very skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But how good was he with a gun? Uh, turns out even better than he was with his hands. Uh, about to come much better with the gun than he was with his hands. On January 3rd, 1979, 18-year-old Alexander joins the Soviet army, placed in a tank regiment, Greeted on his first day by Dmitry Angorov, his lieutenant, who would lead him during the entirety of his service, which would last a little more than four years. Believed that Solonik was stationed first in Russia, then in East Germany. Uh, while Solonik was learning judo, karate, boxing, wrestling, who knows what else growing up. 
He must have also found time to get pretty handy with guns because he came uh, into the military as a pretty decent shot. As soon as he began to train with firearms in the service, he stood out from his peers as an excellent marksman. Dimitri, his lieutenant, would later recall him being the best shot under his command. And here's where some of the uh, first John Wick type shit comes into his bi biography. Dimitri would later report that Sasha could hit any target 250 meters away with any weapon from any position. <laughs> what? Hitting the target over two football fields away. Really? Well, like from a standing position with like a with a handgun? That's basically like some pro gamer Call of Duty type shit. I'm guessing this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I'm I'm also guessing he probably really was an incredible shot. Solonik was rated 10 out of 10 by his superiors in each and every shooting exercise he was graded on. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, again, perfect. Next one. Perfect. Okay. Uh, despite his inexperience as an actual combat tested soldier, he was quickly appointed fire instructor for all the second classes in his unit. He apparently loved this position because it allowed him to train even further, become an even better shot, which I don't even, I don't even know how that would be possible. Uh, in addition to impressing his fellow soldiers with how good he was with a gun, also, of course, stood out with his fists. He's rumored to have broken his self-defense instructor's jaw during the training exercise. Of course he did. Probably broke it with some Chuck Norris type roundhouse kick to his face. Or maybe he broke it just by just staring at it and be like, uh -uh, don't like it. And his jaw just went, just broke. Oh, man. 1983, after serving four years in the military, Sasha's lieutenant was promoted to the newly formed uh, Oman Police Group. And he asked Sasha to join him. O-M-O-N. And Sasha agreed. 1979, when this group had been formed, it was uh, described as being a cross between special forces and the Secret Service. Oman was formed to ensure that there was no terrorist incidents during the 1980 Moscow Summer Olympics small and elite fighting force of military police. And Sasha's Oman training would transform him into a super badass super killer. At the age of 22, Sasha's new training regiment consisted of getting up every morning at 5 a.m., starting his day with a 5K run through the woods, probably uphill both ways. Then he'd shower, clean his room, have breakfast, probably ate fucking bullets at 8 a.m. He'd salute the blood red cross, you know, hammer and Sickle flag, that hammer and sickle symbolizing the union of blue-collar workers and rural peasants coming together, bleeding together to take down Russian royalty, take down the czars. After breakfast, training would resume with classroom lessons given by different instructors and subjects like Russian communist history, how terrible the U.S. and capitalism are, uh, ballistics, shooting physics, even psychology. Officers were taught how to psychologically cope with the killing of others, a lesson that came easily to Solonik, too easily. Uh, these academic lessons would last until noon. Then it was time for lunch and physical training, combat sports, and shooting, where Solonik, of course, dominated. After four months, Sasha passed all his training. He was promoted to the rank of corporal. The day after his promotion, Sasha was sent to a place called the, the uh, Gorkovsky Institute uh, for sniper training to prepare him to be sent to fight for the Soviet Union as a sniper in Afghanistan. But he, but he never made it to Afghanistan as a sniper. Because once he was separated from his buddy, Lieutenant Dimitri, his Russian Lieutenant Dan, Solonik seems to have lost his shit a little bit. Apparently, Dimitri was a calming presence on him. He reportedly got into five separate very violent fights with fellow Amman officers in just four months of being separated from Dimitri. All these fights putting whoever he was fighting against in the hospital. Of course they did. He was the fucking Russian Chuck Norris. I imagine him putting those dudes in the hospital while blindfolded while standing on one leg, while holding a glass of vodka that he never spilled. Uh, I have a description of the last fight that reads like a scene in a late 80s, over-the-top Steven Seagal movie. Sasha was sitting alone in a, you know, at the bar, tall chair, pulled up to the bar, this NCO booze joint, you know, when a group of three other Oman officers walked in and started chatting him up. All friendly at first. These three comrades had just returned from Afghanistan, and they were bragging a bit about all the... Muhadin ass they just kicked. And uh, they'd been over there for three months, and according to them, they'd done all sorts of heroic shit. And then Solonik was like, how about you guys shut fuck up for life? And then they were like, what you just say? Almost dead man? And then Solonik spit in one of their faces, and his spit blew the back of the guy's fucking head off. And it just kept going into the next guy's face and blew his head off. And then the next guy's face, it blew his head off. One spit, three heads, pew, gone. Then he sat back down and said, that's embarrassing. Usually I know spit bullets. Most time I only spit fire. No, it wasn't quite that over the top, but it's, it's close. Uh, the real story is that one of these dudes made the mistake of putting his hand on Sasha's shoulder. 
started telling him he was just little Corporal Newby. <laughs> Wouldn't be able to handle Afghanistan. Probably shit himself and cry for mommy. You know, probably probably just be little baby. So why don't you get lost, little baby? You know, he says that the bar is theirs. You know, anyone who didn't like it could fuck off and blah, blah, blah. Sasha didn't care for any of this. And he started seeing Rhett. And then the soldier with his hand, uh, you know, on him, supposedly said, and I have to say, this sounds like <laughs> uh, something I would make up. But apparently this is uh, a real quote. This is, uh, it said, good evening, little corporal. And now you get out before I rip your balls off and turn you into Enoch. Maybe it just doesn't come across right in the translation. Uh, but that's what he supposedly said to Sasha. And then Sasha spoke back with his, with his fists. He supposedly hit this dude in the face hard enough to break his nose and knock out three of his teeth with one punch. After hitting this guy, Sasha turned to the other two dudes, grabbed one of them you know, uh, by, their, by their arm and dislocated his shoulder with some quick little twist move. Then he swung that dude into the third dude and then kicked that guy in the shin hard enough to break his fucking leg, just collapse his shin. Then Sasha continued to beat the living shit out of all three of them until they were writhing around on the floor in pain and squealing in agony. Then he, then he said some stuff that hopefully sounded cooler uh, in Russian than it does in English. Again, I'm not making this one up. <laughs> he supposedly said, see you later, girls. Next time, come with your brothers and dads. It will be funnier. I swear to God, that's the direct quote from a source. <laughs> Sounds like I wrote this. See you later, girls. Next time, come with your brothers and dads. It will be funnier. Oh, my God. Ah, uh, like, like if I was going to make up something, it would have been so close to that. Uh, take time for hike, girl. Next time, bring your girl daddy to fight for you. I beat your girl daddy like you beat your meat to thought of own mommy. And then I guess he really did spit on him, but just regular spit, not a bullet or fire spit. And then within the hour, he was sitting in the colonel's office and he was being dismissed for being too violent. Uh, and then he expressed apparently no remorse, no apologies for his actions. And his superiors uh, were worried about him. They, they felt he expressed a frightening lack of compassion for others just in general in life. On February 23rd, 1982, he packed up his shit and he headed home to Kurgan, started looking for a new job. And he found work as, and I love this, as an undertaker. Of course he worked as an undertaker. He started working at a, as a morgue, helping embalm bodies. And where do, you, where do you think he was going to end up? At a daycare or as a florist? He started training at a local MMA type gym. About a half decade before Gorbachev had totally dismantled the Soviet Union, 21-year-old Sasha makes some Russian mafia connections with low-level members of the Orakovskaya, Orakovskaya criminal group, a huge Russian, Russian mafia gang active in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, based primarily in Moscow, but with factions in a variety of other Russian cities, like, of course, Kurgan. Sasha meets a guy named Svetlin, who goes by Popov, and Popov's lieutenant, Pyotr Kowalski, uh, a guy who specialized in prostitution, drugs, the kidnapping of foreign businessmen, that kind of stuff for the gang. And Pyotr wanted a, a cut of all the action from all the bars, restaurants, and nightclubs in Kurgan. And yes, even though Kurgan still in the Soviet Union at this time, communists did have nightclubs, restaurants, bars, etc. They were just state-owned. So why would this guy try and steal from the state? How could he do that? Because the state was super corrupt. Because many of these gangsters during the days of communism were in bed with communists, as I mentioned earlier. They'd take a cut of the bar's profits. Profits of the bar was given back to some state agency. And then give some of that cut to the state official willing to look the other way when the books didn't quite, quite line up. You know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, Pyotr wanted 5% of these places' profit in exchange for protecting them from other dirtbags who might take a larger cut. And Pyotr wanted Popov to make this happen. And Popov asked Sasha if he wanted to make some money being a soldier. Being some hired muscle and enforcer for their gang, Sasha agreed and his criminal career begins. And he starts going door to door collecting payments for Popov to give to Pyotr. And, and, and anyone who didn't get, you know, didn't pay would get beaten. And it's likely that numerous people uh, also got killed. For his efforts, Sasha would receive a small percentage of payments of the payments, likely 10% of the money he was collecting to keep for himself. For his first job, he shook someone down for 300,000 rubles and supposedly kept 30,000 for himself. And all he had to do was threaten to break this dude's jaw. And back then, the value of the ruble was much stronger than it is now, and 30,000 rubles were, were pretty comparable to $30,000 $30, US. By the end of 82, Sasha was done with his job at the morgue. He was making more money as an enforcer. I, I hope he said some cool Russian shit when he left that job. I done working on dead bodies. I too busy now. Making the dead bodies. Ha! <laughs> you see what I did there? I killed people now. I make, I make dead bodies. I'm just not working on them. You, you get it. It's a pretty good job. Uh, around this time, super cool gangster guy, Sasha, meets his future first wife, Nadezda, in a nightclub called the Academy 
on the Mi <laughs> Miagotina Street. Nadezda was 23, year old, 23 years old and beautiful. She'd recently studied medicine at the University of Minsk in Belarus, graduated with a degree in surgery while waiting for the government to assign her to a hospital. Uh, she'd been waiting for a year. She decided to uh, keep busy making some money as, as, a, as a nightclub waitress. And I want to share a description of this woman uh, as translated from French, or from, excuse me, from Russian to French to English. It's translated from French to English via Google Translate from the uh, book that served as my primary source for Solonic information, a book translated originally from Russian to French, then to English by Google called Sasha the Macedonian, Life and Death of Alexander Solonik, the incredible story of a Russian special forces policeman who became one of the biggest hitmen of the Russian mafia. It's quite a title. Literally the only book I could find online in ebook form written in any language about this mysterious son of a bitch. So hard to find more than three paragraphs of info almost anywhere on the web about the psychopath. Uh, this is the only Solonik book on Amazon that I am aware of. I found one other self-published book written in English about this guy online that's out of print in most places. Available in paperback via Google Books. No reviews on any site that I could find. Super shitty cover. And a bio that made it sound like it had far less info and was even more poorly written than this book that I used, which is saying a lot. <laughs> the primary source that I used for this, probably the most poorly written book I've, I've ever read in my life. And I've skimmed through a lot of really shitty books for time suck research. Anyway, check out this description of Alexander's first wife that I will read verbatim. Her body was well made. She was 172 centimeters tall, wore a size 36, and had a beautiful chest measurement. Pear-shaped breasts. Her eyes were blue, a very light blue, which gave her a supernatural air with her ash blonde hair. Her teeth were white. She did not smoke and her mouth was well drawn. Her lips were pink and not made up. Only a line of brown liner underlined her magnificent look adorned with her blonde eyebrows, placed like two arcs on her open forehead. Her medium-long hair was styled with a ponytail that made her look serious. Nadezda was really beautiful and seemed intelligent. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Luckily for you, as a listener, I've taken all the info in this shit book and rewritten it into a much more palatable form. The author of this book, Frank Strub, looks and writes like a serial killer. Uh, look him up. F-R-A-N-C-K-S-T-R-U-B. This is his only book, and his Facebook author page has literally four likes. I am thankful that he wrote this book. Thankful to Frank because it does have a lot of details you couldn't find literally anywhere else. And Frank does cite a lot of seemingly legit Russian newspaper sources and stuff at the end of the book. <laughs> and just Frank, he just seems so creepy too. Right, the way he talks about this lady. Mother, I met a beautiful woman. She really excites my zapples. She is 172 centimeters tall and has a beautiful chest measurement, mother. Mother, I like her chest measurement. Her teeth are white and her smile is well drawn. I want to touch her pear-shaped breast, mother. Later in the book, Frank is describing her again, and he writes something even weirder. He writes, Her hand and foot nails were painted dark red. I like her pretty red foot nails, mother. Man, a sexy set of foot nails gets my zapples all riled. Maybe the translation makes it even worse than it is, but holy shit. Uh, for every one page of interesting details in this book, there were like 10 pages of just mundane shit that, that added nothing to the story. Uh, like a full chapter going into painful detail about how cool the Porsche Sasha buys later is. Uh, and then there are five pages dedicated to almost every woman this, that Solonik would meet, where Frank would just go into exhausting, weird detail describing their measurements, eye and hair color, facial features, breast size, what they were wearing, and sometimes even sexual fantasies that supposedly Solonik had about these people. I, I just think it was fantasies that Frank clearly had himself. After making it about a quarter of the way through the book, I was like, oh yeah, that's why this book hasn't been translated in English. It's, it's a pile of shit. Anyway, Solonik meets a hot, smart Russian lady in his hometown. The two fall in love. He, he is enamored with her awesome chest measurements and her sweet painted footnails. While Sasha courts Nadezda, he lives in a small, sparsely furnished apartment in Kurgan. Lives simply, dresses simply, like some type of Spartan warrior. His black combat style boots always clean. His shirt's never wrinkled. He was a simpler version of Christian Bale in American Psycho. In perfect shape, always with a fresh haircut, always clean shaven, living very minimalist. According to Frank, the only possessions he really cared about were his guns. Many guns he oiled and cleaned on a regular basis. His favorite at the time, a Glock 17 Generation 3 9mm with a 17 bullet magazine. He had a few of these, actually, and he would uh, you know, do some target practice in the woods outside the city. He was supposedly legendarily amb ambidextrous, 
and would practice shooting his Glock from both hands. Setting a target 50 yards out, unloading half the magazine with one hand, then tossing in the other hand, continuing to fire. And sometimes you get both Glocks out and shoot them simultaneously at the same target. Probably knock down some trees with fucking roundhouse kicks, you know, as he's shooting both guns while standing on one foot, while balanced on a pine cone or some shit. Uh, sometime in late 1983, it's suspected that murder became a regular part of Sasha's work routine. Later estimated he'd kill seven men during shakedowns for mafia payments before getting his first contract killing and officially becoming a hitman. Uh, Piotr Kalski, uh, the lieutenant or Kal Kalsky, the lieutenant of the gang Sasha worked for, gave him a contract for one Vladimir Solstin in early 1984. And Vladimir was to be shot uh, when he went to see his dentist at 11 Posarske, <laughs> these fucking streets, fuck them, uh, at 11 P Street in Moscow. Uh, Sasha would be paid $250,000, $50,000 in advance, and another $200,000 upon completion of the job. A lot of money. After it was confirmed that Vladimir had been killed, Sasha would return to Kurgan and visit his old friend Popov, right, the man who recruited him, and Popov would give him an envelope full of $200,000 in cash, the remaining balance. A lot more money than he got so far shaking anyone down. Uh, why was Vladimir being killed? Sasha didn't know and he didn't care. Supp supposedly, Vladimir had promised Popov to pay him a large chunk of change every three months on the condition that Popov would not send his troop of about 30 high-end Kazakh prostitutes to work in Moscow. Popov had respected his side of the agreement. Vladimir had never paid Popov, so now Vladimir had to die. Vladimir was the head of the Russian mafia in Kursk, a city of over 400,000, a seven-hour drive south of Moscow, and did a fair amount of business, just like all the big Russian mafia gangs did in Moscow. And every two months, Popov knew that Vladimir had his teeth cleaned by his favorite dentist in Moscow. He made the trip to Kursk with five bodyguards, driving an armored Mercedes GL. His bodyguards carried AK-47s, and he carried a mini Uzi. This is not going to be an easy target, but Sasha would take him down and earn the nickname Super Killer for doing this job. Sasha went directly to Moscow after leaving Popov's house. He drove alone nonstop in his BMW 525i, left roughly two weeks before Vladimir's dental appointment. Uh, Sasha would have flown and saved himself a day's worth of travel, but he didn't want there to be a record of him ever going to, to Moscow when Vladimir was going to be there or when Vladimir was going to die. He didn't want his name attached to a flight reservation or to a rental car agreement. When he made it to Moscow, he went to the campus of Moscow University where he would blend in with other students around his own age and he paid cash to sublet a dorm room for a few weeks. Smart, right? It was a place where he would stick out the least. The morning after his first night in his room, he gets up at 8 a.m., gets dressed, has a big black, you know, a cup of coffee, a uh, croissant, a student cafeteria, sets off to find and scope out Vladimir's dentist office. He times how long it takes him to make it from the front door of the building to the dental office, 38 seconds. He writes down the dentist's phone number, goes to a local bar, asks for coffee and access to the phone booth, calls the dentist, makes a cleaning appointment for himself for the next day using a fake name. Next day, he shows up, gets a feel for the room. He likes what he sees. The small office has uh, only one dental chair and that dental chair is near a window. The chair's position placed a patient's head nice and close to the window, and the way the dentist would tilt the chair while he was checking his guy's teeth, it would open up the patient's head and upper chest for a clean shot through the window from across the street. So now he needed to find a place in the building across the street to shoot from. There were only apartments occupied in the building opposite the dentist, no attic or terrace, no good. Right? He goes to a restaurant across the street suggested to him by the dental receptionist, Darina, to use as a hideout if necessary after the shooting. He liked Darina. He'd actually take her out for, for drinks a few nights later. She'd soon witness one of his murder victims without knowing he killed him. And then shortly thereafter, become his mistress and actually would later become his second wife. Uh, more about Darina later. Uh, Sasha did further exploration of the building across the street and he finally looks out. He, he didn't think he could find anything, but then he finds a storage room that happens to have a huge window in it that does line up with the dental office. He's able to, you know, pick the lock, get in this place, uses some binoculars inside the room, does some recon, figures out he can, in fact, you know, pull off the necessary shot with a sniper rifle from that room. He waits six days for Vladimir's dental appointment. When the day comes, he grabs all his stuff from his dorm, tells the concierge uh, that he's leaving for St. Petersburg. He spends the morning visiting the National Museum of Modern History in Moscow, checking out exhibits on the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, the Revolutionary War of 1917, World War II, the Cold War you know, with the U.S., goes to a restaurant across the street from the dental building, uh, has a nice lunch, takes his duffel bag containing a sniper rifle, all kind of broken up, uh, broken apart, ammo, bipod to the storage room, takes him half an hour to assemble everything. He unfolds the bipod, positions it, places his rifle perfectly on top of it, adjusts the sharpness of his telescope, adjusts its elevation until it's perfectly centered. 
You know, it was a semi-automatic Russian military rifle specifically designed for precision shooting with a scope, an, SV, an SVD sniper rifle used by the Russian army, known for being extremely reliable and durable, equipped with a PSO-1 telescope with enough magnification to pull off a shot a thousand meters away. And uh, Sasha was only 40 meters away from the dental office's window. Three and a half hours later, Vladimir arrives for his cleaning appointment, preceded by two armed bodyguards, followed by three others. Solonik watches him through the scope, walk into the building, right? Waits for him to pop into the dental office, waits for him, sees him do all that, waits for him to pop into the dental chair and sit down. So strange, right? Just so methodical with this execution, so clinical. Before the guy sits down, he watched him shake the dentist's hand, take off his jacket. He can see the holster and butt of the guy's Uzi. Sasha repositions his rifle on the bipod, pulls the trigger, you know, on a few imaginary shots with nothing in the chamber just to make sure everything is nice and steady and perfect. He knows if he misses with his first shot, he's not going to get his second or might not get. He lays down on the floor, aligns his body up with the rifle, puts the target in the scope's crosshairs. He can see now the bottom of Vladimir's face, the top of the man's head. He can see the dentist's arm moving around, sometimes blocking his face. The dentist has his back to him. He doesn't want to risk shooting the dentist in the arm or the back and having Vladimir roll out of the chair alive and leave the room. So he waits around 10 minutes for the dentist to move away from the chair to grab something. And as soon as the dentist leaves the window, Sasha pulls the trigger and Vladimir's head explodes. The bullet entered through the top of his head, came out through the bottom of his nose, shredding the front half of his brain, obliterating his upper face. He was certainly instantly dead. But Solonik still fires four more quick shots that all land into his upper chest. It took the dentist a moment to figure out what happened. The suppressor on Solonik's rifle had muffled the sound of the shots enough that he didn't even hear them. The bullets obviously broke through the window, but they didn't shatter it, so the shots didn't really startle him. It all happened so fast, the dentist went to grab a different dental tool. Here's the sound of just, you know, this little plink, 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 plink. Something popped into the glass. Then suddenly his patient Vladimir's face is covered in blood. The man's clearly dead. His body's dripping blood onto the floor from his chest. He calls out for help. You know, shouts uh, that his receptionist, Darina, and the bodyguards enter the room. They find Vladimir dead. Darina passes out. One of the five bodyguards quickly tests Vladimir's pulse, gives orders to the other four who start to run down the stairs and reach the street. Meanwhile, Solonik, he's almost finished taking apart his, his rifle equipment, throwing it all back into his red duffel bag. When the bodyguards reach the street, Solonik is walking out a door on the opposite side of the building and just walks casually into his car and just drives away. Bodyguards never saw him, never had any fucking idea who shot their boss. It was the perfect hit. Solonik drove back to Moscow, dreaming of everything he'd buy with $250,000. He knew he'd buy a large diamond engagement ring for Nadizda and ask her to marry him, which he did. And, uh, you know, yet, and yes, he had just seen Darina. Uh, he liked them both. Uh, from this point forward, Sasha would be known by those who knew him as the super killer. When Sasha reached Kurgan on a Wednesday around 2 p.m., he went straight to Popov's house to get the rest of his money, that 200 grand. Popov's overjoyed. Sasha had done a tremendous first job. So smooth. No loose ends. The two toasted glasses filled with high-end pure malt scotch whiskey, right? And then Popov gives Sasha a big satchel of cash. The two men finish a second glass of scotch. When Popov offers uh, Sasha a new contract, he wants him now to kill a man named Miroslav, another rival gangster Popov called the Terror of the Balkans. The man above Popov, Pyotr, had already given Miroslav two warnings for encroaching on some of their business in Moscow, and the Yugoslavian had not listened. Popov had previously sent other contract killers to try and take this dude down, and they'd all been killed. Popov told Sasha that as soon as Miroslav feels like he's walked into a trap, he does not hesitate to take out his guns and empty them into everyone around him. Popov told Sasha that if he could kill Miroslav and three of his minions guarding him by Easter 1984, he'd be paid $750,000. So just made a quarter of a million. Now he's going to round that up to a full million with another hit. He'd get 100000 right away. The balance when the job was done. Half the money would be paid in U.S. dollars, half in Swiss francs. The two men grab a third glass of scotch, clink glasses, and Sasha says to him, consider it done. Probably cooler than that. Consider it dead. Ha <laughs> ha. Just consider him. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it for you. Uh, after agreeing to this job, Solonik reunites with Nadizda after stopping at the jeweler's. He asked for her hand in marriage, offered her a huge diamond ring, and she accepted without hesitation. Now they're engaged. After spending the rest of the day together, Sasha went car shopping. Uh, the next morning, he traded his old BMW in for a new Porsche for $75,000, a loaded 911 Turbo, and it was super cool. And I'm not going to talk about it for 15 fucking pages, like Frank does in his weird book. It was fast. It made Sasha dick hard when he drove it, and it filled him with, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get it. Sasha also upgraded his wardrobe. He got a new leather jacket. Gold cross necklace, gold watch, black shades. Looked like a Russian version of Neo. 
from the Matrix. Classic Russian gangster. He got some cool gang tattoo comm- commemorating his hit. He was, he was no Gopnik. Not going to wear them fucking knockoff Adidas tracksuits. He was a real gangster. And he took Nadiz out for a celebration dinner at the nicest restaurant in Kurgan. And the next day, started planning another trip to Moscow to fulfill another contract. He knew that this time he'd have to kill his target at close range. He'd have to walk into the nightclub, kill Miroslav and his bodyguards up close and personal. Uh, so, you know, he was making plans for that. He's also making plans uh, to have a, a, a baby and get married to Nadizda. Um, for his hit, he wants to bring two semi-automatic handguns that he can fire at multiple targets quickly with. He figures he's going to have about three seconds to shoot Miroslav and his bodyguards before being shot at himself. He brings four guns to Moscow, two Beretta 92s, two Glock 17s, plenty of ammo. Throws all this and some clothes and toiletries into that red duffel bag, hops into that new Porsche. It was the coolest car anyone had ever driven in the history of Earth. And he leaves for Moscow and takes off on what's uh, supposedly a really beautiful and scenic drive, passing through grand and varied landscapes, dense forests full of large fir trees. I guess the tundra when not frozen is very lush and green in this area. It looks like an endless golf course. He's driving, you know, through beautiful mountains, alpine, ultra clean blue lakes that would soon full of, be full of people sailing. 30 hours after his departure, he arrives in Moscow, parks his dope ass Porsche on a small, quiet street several blocks from another dorm room. He'd again decided to pay some cash to stay in. The next day, he actually goes back to the dentist's office, asks the receptionist and his future second wife, Darina, out on another date. She agrees to meet up. He's able to get some info out of her about the investigation into the death of the crime boss he'd killed in her office, which apparently she has no idea about at this time. Uh, didn't sound like the police knew a uh, clue who did it. You know, she has no idea that, you know, that he did it. Uh, the police just thought it was a gang hit, but that's all they knew. He takes Jarena to a restaurant nightclub called Le Petit Boris, the place where he's planning to kill Miroslav. So that's kind of ridiculous. He just killed one dude in this, this lady's office. Now he's taking her on a date to a place where he intends to kill some other dudes. Uh, when they get there, the restaurant's three quarters full. There's a bouncer at the main entrance. A waiter sits him at a small round table. Sasha takes in all kinds of details. The club is very lit up. The music's very loud. This provides him with some advantages. He's going to be able to clearly identify his target, and the sound of the shots will be partially covered, especially since he's going to have a suppressor on each of the guns. Now, those directly around him would likely know what was going on, but the noise would keep everyone else clueless until people started screaming, which would help him make it to the exit. After sharing a few glasses of champagne with Darina, Sasha goes to the bathroom and inspects the place out further. He takes out a pencil and a small notebook from his pocket, begins to draw up a plan. He further surveys the layout of the tables, the bar, three dance floors, spots a, at the main entrance at the club portion of the building. Uh, there's a turnstile door, which is going to possibly complicate his escape. He makes a note to not get stuck in that door, to go through it as quickly as possible. He's also worried about the bouncer at the entrance. You know, how's he going to react when Sasha takes out two weapons? He has to be neutralized when Sasha enters, he decides. So he decides maybe he's going to hit him in the stomach with his gun, you know, or maybe he'll cover his mouth with some chloroform, knock him out quietly. He makes a note to steal some chloroform, which he does later. Dude was a pro. Put effort into the shitty things he did. And then after dinner, Sasha and Darina go back to her house and get it on. A lot of pages dedicated to that. He fondled her beautiful chest measurements. He sucked on her sexy-ass footnails. Hail, Lucifina. Um, the next day, he finds a bar uh, to call Papa from. Tells, her that he, tells him that he's ready to take out Miroslav. Popov informs him that Miroslav should show up at the club on Tuesday night between 9 and 10 p.m. He'd gotten word that Miroslav was in a weekly poker game. and Some of his friends, you know, they would play at this back table in the restaurant. The morning of the day of the hit, Solonik found the perfect parking spot just outside the restaurant and club. Doesn't want to leave his getaway car location to chance. He loads eight magazines for his handguns, puts four of them into special, uh, a special sleeveless jacket he designed or that was designed to carry all this stuff. All of this is in the car. And then he kills time in the area at various cafes, museums until it gets dark around 7 p.m. At this time, he fetches his weapons from his car and the magazines and checks them all over again, make sure everything's in operating order. Then he sits in his car, waits until 9 p.m., just listen to the radio, trying to, you know, be inconspicuous. Then he gets out, hangs out in front of the restaurant slash club as if he's just another person in the crowd, wait for someone to join him, smoke some cigarettes, like a lot of others around him are doing. At 9.35, Sasha's target Miroslav emerges from his car, enters the restaurant, flanked by those bodyguards. Sasha, a pistol in each hand inside the pockets of his coat, quickly heads, you know, into the restaurant right behind him. When he gets inside, Miroslav is 15 feet in front of him. Luckily, the bouncer, nowhere to be found, doesn't have to chloroform him. He takes a, catches a lucky break. No chloroform needed. Sasha then puts a hand on each of the two bodyguards closest to Miroslav. Like he's got his guns, guns in his hands, takes them out of his jacket, puts them on the shoulders of these guys, 
pulls them back hard down to the ground. As they fall, he fires the gun he'd been holding in his left hand at the third guard, who started to take out an Uzi. And with the gun in his right hand, he shoots Miroslav four times, once in the head, three in the chest, similar to the, the, the shot, you know, patterning of the previous targets. Now a new contract had just been executed by Sasha. I wonder if he said anything while this was happening. You know, hopefully he said some more cool Russian tough guy shits. Hey, Miroslav, your doctor just call. What? Who are you? How do you know my doctor? He have bad news. He say you have bad case of not listening to people. You have two seconds to live. What are you? Ah, I, super killer, maker of dead body. Pleasure to do business with you. And then he just roundhouse Chuck Norris kicked the heads off everyone else in the club in less than fucking one second. No. Uh, what he really did do was quickly shoot the body, two bodyguards he pulled to the ground. And then he immediately runs back out the club door hops into his Porsche, speeds down the street, turns a corner, then slows down, drives normally, keeps driving on out of Moscow, heading east, back to Kurgan, right? Leaving four dead men behind him. Once he made it back, he collects his money from his, an ecstatic Popov, right? The guy he wanted dead that was so hard to kill is now dead, and he gets, a, he gets another, another $650,000 in addition to the $100,000 he already had. He had just gotten $250,000, right? Just, just recently, before all that. So he has enough money for he and Nadija. Uh, to live well for five years easy. Nadizda, all these names. Uh, for the first time in his life, he begins to think of big vacations he can take, certain destinations, the Mediterranean he might like to visit. He and Nadizda, they take a two-week vacation in Croatia on the island of Var, staying in a four-star palace by the seas, living large now. In July of 1984, Sasha and Nadizda get married in front of both their families. A lot of their friends, including various members of the Orakovskaya, or, or, yeah, Orakovskaya gang, uh, a year later, 1985, Nadezda, Nadezda I, I pronounce her name different ways. Oh, none of these names sound familiar to me. I don't, I don't know anybody by any of these names other than maybe Sasha. Uh, in 1985, uh, Nadezda gives birth to a girl named Victoria. Life's going great for Sasha, right? He continues to do business with his mafia friends from Kurgan, makes a fair amount of trips to Moscow and other places around Russia, doing who knows what for the next two years. I'm guessing a fair amount of murdering. Probably a fair amount of dudes getting their heads kicked off their bodies. Uh, then one day in 1987, there's a knock on the door. And when he answers it, it's some of the Kurgan police waiting to arrest him. An 18-year-old girl had filed a complaint against him for rape. Solonik is stunned. Nadezda shouted, it's not true. He had been away for two weeks. These are false accusations. That didn't stop the police from handcuffing Sasha, taking him to the station. He's put in a cell immediately. And a week later, he's standing in front of Judge Boris Vladistok, who asks him, you are really Alexander Solonik, born October 16th, 1960 in Kurgan. Yes, Your Honor. In addition to Sasha and the judge, there's two armed police officers present in the judge's office. There's others in the courthouse. And then according to one version of the Solonik legend, he goes full fucking John Wick, big time. And Sasha quickly grabs one of the police officer's guns, uses it to shoot the other officer before shooting the officer he'd taken the gun from. Then he spins around, shoots the judge, who threw his hands up in the air, was about to beg for his life. All were dead in seconds. Probably in this legend, probably says himself to the judge too. Listen, your honor, you guilty of being dead. I don't know what he'd say. Uh, there was a window in the judge's office and Sasha opens it, jumps out, jumps about 15 feet down to the ground where he sprains both his ankles. He's able to hobble away as he flees from the courthouse with a gun in his hand, runs into three other police officers, empties the rest of the gun he'd taken magazines, uh, he empties the rest of this gun's magazines into these three men, killing them all before they could fire any return shots. Then he grabs one of their guns and then keeps running. Sasha has now become the most wanted fugitive in Russia for the murder of five police officers and a judge and the alleged rape of a local woman. Now, did all of this happen? I don't think so. But it's written in, in some of the accounts. I think much more likely he was charged with rape and escaped without shooting or killing anyone. And I'll explain why I think that very shortly. Sasha knew exactly where to hide Kirk, in, in Kurgan. Uh, in the, he hid in the forest, right? A large, thick forest where the police, you know, didn't initially bother to search. Uh, he had a tough time collecting weapons, though, he, and he felt like he needed weapons to stay alive. So he hopped on a city bus one night, snuck back home, grabbed him, picked up a lot of contract killing cash, leaving a lot of it to Nadizda as well. And he also supposedly confessed to her that he did sleep with the girl he was accused of raping, but swore it was consensual. Right? Nadizda, obviously not pleased. And he quickly leaves home, uh, and he uh, this confession will will lead to his first divorce. Makes sense. I don't think a lot of women are cool with, baby, don't be mad. I didn't rape anybody. I mean, yeah, I fucked a bunch, you know, I fucked some chicks on the side, but, you know, hey, why are you mad? Uh, Sasha didn't know where to go. He couldn't go to his parents. The police are waiting for him there. So he goes back to the forest, lives like a hermit for a month, probably doing shit like headbutting huge trees to the ground to blow off steam. 
maybe bench press and boulders. And then he's found by the police and arrested again. They finally do look in the forest. They take him to the police station, interrogate him for a long time, then lock him up. At his trial, somehow this motherfucker escapes again. Right? Now, now I will say, in the sources, it's, it's very confusing. In some sources, it seems like this, what I'm about to tell you, and the first thing were one thing. And then in some you know, kind of narratives, it's like he escaped twice. So there is a chance he just escaped one time from a courtroom. Because uh, in this situation, he's, he's uh, you know, on the second floor of a nine-story reinforced concrete building. He's uh, sentenced to eight years for rape. So he's not in the judge's office. He's like just in the courtroom. And, and I don't think that first thing happened because there's no mention in the narratives that talk about him, you know, being in here twice about him getting sentenced to a lot more time for, you know, killing a judge and a bunch of police officers. So that probably didn't happen, but he does escape. Apparently he jumps out the window. So possibly escapes again, possibly for the first time, makes it to a, jumps out the window again, makes it to a hearse that was waiting for him down on the streets. So that's a nice, you know, touch, nice detail. The hearse there, uh, some fellow gang members then drive him to Tillman, a two hour drive North of Kurgan in Western Siberia. Uh, Tumen, the first Russian city in Siberia built around the Tura river built by Fedor, the first of Russia in 1589, on the site where the Tatars of Siberia had also built a town. Its name comes from the Mongolian word for 10,000, which also designates a military unit. The city had almost 500,000 people, was very close to Kurgan. Sasha could go back and forth during the day, continue business with the local mafia. And he does that for the next three months. Uh, Nadezda divorces him. And he's like, fuck, I don't care. I have another girl named Darina in Moscow. And he brings Darina out from Moscow and just marries her quickly. Mistress, hear this. You have been promoted to wife. Uh, and then he quickly gets Darina pregnant with his son. Mistress, you've been promoted to wife and mother. After About three months after being free, Sasha decides to remove a tattoo in the shape of an Orthodox cross that he had on his right hand, make it a little harder for police to easily identify him. He'd also planned on having a mole removed from his face, but he wouldn't have time to do that. While in the tattoo parlor, the police bust in, grab him. He's taken to a Kurgan prison to begin serving that eight-year sentence. He'd busted out of the courtroom to avoid serving. And it was in this prison shortly after arriving where Sasha had a legendary fight against 12 other prisoners. This is the most Chuck Norris out of all the Chuck Norris shit he supposedly did. According to this oft-repeated legend, as a former police officer, he was supposed to have been put into a special area away from the general population because the other prisoners didn't like former police officers, right? Even though he was just a police officer for a very brief time. But that doesn't happen. Uh, Sasha, rumored to have stood around 5'6", five, 5'7", five, faced with the challenge of fighting a dozen men, all well-built, hardened prisoners, most of whom are taller and quite a bit bigger than him. And these men uh, not only outnumber him greatly, they're also armed randomly with shovels. <laughs> and the story is that Sasha took a beating, you know, took a beating early on, even got hit in the head with a shovel. But during that beating, he managed to get one of the shovels away from one of these dudes, and he used that shovel to beat the ever-loving shit out of every single one of them. By the end of the fight, Sasha was bloody and beaten, but still standing, right? And these guys were not still standing. <laughs> After this fight, uh, again, according to legend, no one ever fucked with him in prison again. He spent the rest of his time behind bars, known as the baddest motherfucker in prison. And I wonder, <laughs> after reading this kind of stuff, I, like, I wonder if there were Solonik jokes similar to all the Chuck Norris type jokes floating around in Russia, like in the 90s. Do you remember those Chuck Norris jokes? I loved them so much. Stuff like... Uh, I wrote a couple down here in the notes. Chuck Norris is so fast, he can run around the world and punch himself in the back of the head. Chuck Norris sleeps with a nightlight, not because Chuck Norris is afraid of the dark, but the dark is afraid of Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris doesn't read books. He stares them down until he gets the information he wants. <laughs> when Chuck Norris does a push-up, he isn't lifting himself up. He's pushing the earth down, right? Have you heard these? I love them so much. I wonder uh, if there were Solonic versions, what they would sound like. You know, like in Russia. In Russia, only people who die of natural causes are people who never meet the Rush Alexander Solonik. Alexander Solonik never get drunk on vodka. Vodka get drunk on Alexander Solonik. One year winter not happen in Siberia because Solonik not feel like wearing jacket and winter afraid to upset him. I'll stop now. These are terrible. But something along those lines. For the duration of Solonik's sentence after his big fight, he avoids alcohol, drugs, focuses on lifting weights, his overall fitness so he can be that much stronger and scarier when he gets out. Then just a year or two into his sentence, he earns the right to uh, work in the industrial part of the prison, a part of the prison that was less vigilantly, vi vigilantly guarded, and of course he escapes again. Of course he does. Uh, this time, he sneaks into a ventilation duct, crawls until he reaches the outside where the guards were conveniently not watching and flees in April of 1990. 
Now it's the wild 90s plus the super killer. How crazy can things get? Sasha's old Rus- Russian mafia friends down in Kurgan had helped him with this escape. They'd paid to have some guards look the other way when he bounced, and now he owed him. His old buddy Popov told him that if he could kill a man named Dauna, the head of the mafia and Cuman, his debt would be paid, and he could you know, get back to making money by fulfilling future contracts. So Dauna's uh, execution would take place on Tuesday, July 3rd, 1990, less than three months after he'd been busted out. Sasha, for reasons unknown, chose not to plan this one out like past hits. He improvised it from start to finish, apparently. He confessed all this stuff later uh, during another prison uh, stint we'll talk about later. He walked right up to Downa, who was eating dinner in a restaurant popular with underworld figures. Downa recognizes him, holds out his hand to greet him. Sasha does the same. Then all of a sudden, empties his Walther pistol magazine into him. And uh, did he feel more comfortable openly killing him in front of numerous eyewitnesses because of the relative lawlessness of the wild 90s he now found himself in? Perhaps. Uh, He definitely had to have said something to him this time, right? Good to see you, Downer. Is it just me? Or do you have more holes in you than used to? What are you talking? I don't have... <laughs> right, whatever. Bang, bang, bang. Whatever noise. Now you get it. Uh, as Downer laid dead in a bloodbath, Sasha ran out the restaurant, hopped into his old Porsche 911 that apparently his gangster buddies had held on to him, held on to uh, for him. And he drives back to Kurgan. After this hit, Popoff uh, picks up several big money contracts that would take place back in Moscow. So off to Moscow he goes. Darina and their, and, and their son travel with him. They don't stay together very long, though. In 1992, Darina divorces Sasha, tired of him cheating on her, and, you know, probably tired of all the murdering he was doing. Uh, Sasha would stay in Moscow another two and a half years, where he would kill at least four other mafia leaders in 93 and 94. The first of these four was a man named Viktor Nikirov, uh, who went by the nickname Kalina. Sasha would shoot him with a Dragunov, or, or Dragunov, military sniper rifle. For this hit, Solonok went to this dude's house. He drove a van to clean his neighborhood, parked it about 400 meters down the street, almost 440 yards, right? Almost four, four and a half football fields. Sets up his sniper rifle on a bipod again, cracks a side van door open, and waits for this dude to walk out into the yard. And eventually he does. The guy walks outside with a bone in his hand, throws it to his dog, and then promptly falls down dead in a growing pool of his own blood. Like as Sasha had shot him in the fucking head. One shot, one kill from over 400 yards away. Probably did it with his eyes closed too. Right? Probably, probably did it while, I don't know, making a burrito or something with his other hand. Uh, Solonik's next target was a man named Valery uh, Dlugach, a.k.a. Globus, or Globus. He killed him in mid-December 1993. Globus was cautious, surrounding himself with four bodyguards at all time. Bodyguards who apparently looked somewhat like him to confuse people. Bodyguards who dressed like him. You know, from a distance, it was very hard to tell who was the bodyguard and who was the crime boss. So Sasha decides just to kill the whole group. And he decides to use four of Popov's men to help him with this hit. He has each of these men rent a van from four different rental agencies. They would work in two teams of two vans each. Each guy has a walkie-talkie connecting them to Sasha. They were going to park in strategic positions within a few blocks of Globus' house where Sasha would be watching Globus. When Globus left his black or his house in his black Mercedes S-Class car, Sasha then would tell one of them to drive in front of the car. Right, tell one team, so get two vans in front of the car, depending on which route he would take to leave his house. There's only two routes. And then the other team would park behind him and block him from backing up. Instead of bringing a sniper rifle for this hit, he brought a fucking rocket-propelled grenade launcher, a basalt RPG-7, an anti-tank weapon, the same rocket launcher used by Russian military. (laughs) So with this weapon, he wouldn't need to differentiate Globus and his body. He was going to blow them all up. And when the gate uh, to Globus's compound opens, right, and the Mercedes rolls out, the plan is set into motion. It works perfectly. When Globus's car is about 200 yards from him and boxed in by uh, four vans, he fires this RPG, direct hit, literally blows Globus's car the fuck up. Globus and his henchmen, blown apart, uh, burned alive, you know? Look like you can't handle heat, Globus. Should have gotten out of bomb kitchen. Uh, his four helpers abandoned, they'd abandoned their vans, you know, before he, uh, before he blew it all up. And then he did fire a couple more rocket propelled grenades to uh, blow up their vans, just to destroy all the evidence. And, and I, and I hate to break up the action right now, but, uh, we do have one more ad to get through. So sorry about that. Time suck is also brought to you today by Alexander Solonik's black belts, grenades, and machine guns, super killer self-defense seminar. Hello, comrade. World is rough out there. Lot of bad guy, lot of crime. You need to protect self. Best defense is good killing of everyone in way. You never know who might be bad guy someday. So kill them before chances take. 
I teach many things. I teach neck break karate chop, skull crush stomp, roundhouse decapitate kick. I teach to shoot way into any room that may be full of bad guys. To launch grenade from far away, blow up car of possible bad guy. Everyone may be bad guy. Never can be too safe, so don't delay. Sign up today. Kill everyone in way. Time Suck is not responsible for any murder charge or litigation that may follow killing everyone in way. Go to Alexander Solnik's Black Belts, Grenades, and Machine Guns, Superkiller, Self Defense Seminar.com for more details. Uh, sorry about that. Ad, ads are over now. <laughs> that was a last minute sponsor. I just uh, I couldn't resist turning down. Four weeks after blowing up Globus and his men, uh, Sasha kills Globus' replacement. Vladislav Vinner, a.k.a. Bobin, on January 17th, 94. Sasha takes him down Macedonian style in a nightclub, lighting him up with a gun on each hand. Two months later, he kills Antoly Semenov, a.k.a. Rambo, an associate of Globus. This time he raided Rambo's compound with a troop of 10 mafia soldiers. They went uh, carrying Glaznoskov machine guns, and apparently they created a fucking bloodbath. Rambo's men defended his compound with more machine guns. Sasha was shot in the forearm in this battle and, of course, kept fighting. He personally emptied a full Glock magazine to Rambo's last two bodyguards when he finally made it to the room Rambo was hiding in. By the time he made it to Rambo, only four of his ten hired soldiers were still alive. He let Rambo get down on his knees, beg for his life, before putting the end of the barrel of his Glock against the man's forehead and pulling the trigger. And I'm sure he said some stuff. Make final wish, Rambo. You should wish for God to make miracle. Come down himself for to defend you. Might be able to get away in five or ten seconds and take me to kill God. Uh, Solnik would confess to all these assassinations again after he was arrested, before he would escape again. A few weeks later, Solnik left Moscow to head back to Tiumen to uh, talk to uh, a dude named Mammoth, leader of the most powerful criminal group in Tiumen at the time. Mammoth owed another gangster Solnik was working for a million dollars. Sasha was sent to give him one last chance to pay up. Mammoth said no. A few days later, Mammoth and several other influential crime bosses in Tiumen turn up dead. Weird. Shortly after Solnik returns to Moscow while conducting some business in Moscow's Piotrovsky marketplace, he and a friend are stopped by police officers for an ID check. Instead of causing a scene, they don't argue, don't fight back, and just quietly agree with the officers to go to the police station. Huh, seems pretty normal. For some reason, they're not handcuffed or even searched. Uh, Solonik walked to the police station carrying a raincoat over his arm that no one checked under. They should have because he had a submachine gun under there. More John Wick type shit coming up. Once in the police station, Solnik flashes his weapon, opens fire on the unsuspecting officers, kills four of them. Fleeing the station on foot, he shoots and kills two security guards and another police officer, seven dudes. Also gets shot in the kidneys. He climbs over a tall fence, able to continue to climb, jumps over uh, onto the other side and runs off. And this actually seems to have happened. According to Solonik lore, surviving police officers were astounded with his shot accuracy. As he's fleeing, the legend goes that while Solonik is running away, uh, he fires his gun three times at one officer who was hiding behind a cement pillar and all three bullets hit the same hole. Okay, all right. Uh, despite escaping that day, he was caught uh, a short time later in October of 94, this time immediately thrown into one of Russia's most notorious prisons after allegedly confessing to many of the hits we've already talked about. This uh, prison known as Detention Center 1 located in Moscow, and when Solonik was sent there, it was considered the most secure prison in all of Russia. It has stood as some form of a detention center since 1775, starting out as an insane asylum, expanding to house juvenile delinquents, evolved into a prison for 300 men and 150 women in the early 19th century. In 1945, expanded to hold 2,000 pr prisoners and refortified. Over the years, the prison would house Nazis, famous Russian criminals like one we already talked about, Mikhail Kordakovsky, right, the billionaire talked about earlier, one-time richest man in Russia, housed various gangsters, yeah, political prisoners, by the time Solonik got there, it could hold 5,000 inmates. No one had ever escaped. While in prison, after he recovered from his operation, uh, from an operation to, to heal up his kidney, Solonik started working out again, started studying subjects like foreign languages, literature on the prison computers. Why foreign languages? Well, because he was going to leave the country once he escaped. And he wanted to be able to speak the language of his new country. He, he knew he wouldn't be there for long, he, which was an especially ambitious thought to have, considering, again, that no one had ever escaped from this prison before. But he was Sasha the Macedonian, Alexander the Great. And he had powerful buddies on the outside who wanted him out so he could get back to killing. July 5th, 1995, only eight months after he'd been arrested, Solonik becomes the first prisoner to escape. Supposedly only two have escaped since. The official version of this story is that the mafia had paid off one of the guards, a guy named Sergei Menjikov. And he was able to supply Solonik with a rope and several hooks and a handgun. And then on a sunny summer's day, Solonik hid some clothes under his blanket in order to make other guards think he was sleeping, buy himself some time. And then Menjikov got him out of his cell, 
took him to the roof of the jail where he scaled down the building, snuck to the parking lot to a nearby waiting BMW that was waiting for him. Surprised he didn't just use his giant dick, you know, like, like as a rope to lower himself down or that he didn't just fucking punch his way, just punch through the walls, you know, walk it, maybe make me quickly dig a tuggle, tunnel only using roundhouse kicks. A news agency later reported that poor uh, Sergei Maneshkov, that uh, guy who helped him out, his dead body was found in the river. Not much of a thank you for helping Sasha. After this escape, Interpol now helping the Russian police search for him. Also, thanks to his confessions to various hits, almost every major criminal group in Russia, other than the Orokovskaya gang he worked for, wanted him dead. Then supposedly a $10 million bounty was placed on his head, and mafia leaders working with corrupt Russian police got the police to agree to hand Sasha over if they found him first. And then these other mafia uh, leaders approach his own gang with this offer of $10 million to turn Sasha over to them, right, to, to get rid of him. And they agree, supposedly. This is one possibility uh, of many of what may have put him in, in, this, uh, in the crosshairs of all these gangs. Another possibility is that the gangster I mentioned earlier, Rambo, was a mob leader that Solonik had not been hired to hit. Some sources say he tried to extort that guy for money on his own. He went rogue and started planning missions without uh, permission, and that didn't sit well with superiors. There are a lot of versions of him basically getting too big for his britches and various mafia leaders being like, this, this guy's got to go. When Solonik hears about the price on his head, he gets the fuck out of Russia, buys a beautiful 10-room uh, villa with a swimming pool, basketball court, golf course, lavish garden full of sculptures on a huge piece of property just outside of Athens, Greece. Some sources say he built up his own mafia organization there of around 50 dudes and controlled narcotics around Athens, also continue with contract killings that now he is assigning or, you know, you know just committing on his own, uh, primarily in Eastern Europe. Uh, they also ended up doing some business back in Russia. Supposedly, Greece is where he got the nickname Sasha the Macedonian for killing some gangster while firing two handguns at the same time like he was some Macedonian warrior holding two swords. Also got that nickname because of the ancient conqueror Alexander the Great, you know, another one of his nicknames, and Alexander the Great was the king of Macedonia, a Macedonian. So, makes sense. Some sources say he uh, had his face altered in Greece by reconstructive plastic surgery to hide his identity. Uh, apparently, again, like I was saying, he, he'd still pop over to Russia after moving there, and it's believed he was in Russia on December 31st, 1996, at the Red Star Nightclub, located on the Supreme Soviet Square in Moscow to celebrate New Year's Eve. At this club, he meets Svetlana Kotova, dark brunette beauty who had been a Miss Russia 1996 finalist, and one-time author Frank Strub's description of her is interesting. Here's what he wrote again. This is verbatim. Maybe it's the translation. Make it creepier than it sounds. She was magnificent. Her long hair around her face made her look like goddess. Her only jewel was pearly pearl necklace <laughs> that shone on her white skin. Svetlana had large green eyes, large mouth, and fairly fine, long and slightly curved aquiline nose. <laughs> aquiline. There we go. Aquiline nose. Her arms were thin and ended in admirable hands. <laughs> Her superb legs were long and thin and beautifully highlighted by black matte tights. She was 15 centimeters taller than him, but she had high heels. Svetlana had almond-shaped eyes and a tiny mole at the corner of her right eye on the side of the nasal wall. What the fuck? Mother, I've met, <laughs> Mother, I've met someone. Her name is Svetlana, and she has fairly fine, long, and slightly curved aquiline nose. And I really like her admirable hands, mother. They get me riled up more than footnails. Nothing gets my sex apples riled more than footnails, but admirable hands are close second, mother. Uh, aquiline, by the way, means hooked, shaped like an eagle's beak. I'm pretty sure no woman or man wants their nose described as being like a fucking eagle's beak. Right? <laughs> Isn't that positive? Damn, look at that hot-ass rush girl. Look at that sexy brunette, man. No, no, not her, not her. The, the one over there with the fucking eagle's beak. Man, that's a hot-ass beak. God, I'd like to grab that big old hook beak, do some shit. Anyway, uh, Sasha meets Svetlana at this club, and the two fall in love or lust or whatever. Svetlana uh, takes a, a, a off to spend a week's vacation in Greece with Sasha uh, a little while after they meet, to, to her severe detriment. On January 30, after spending a week with his new girlfriend and his lavish new Greek digs, the super killer's luck finally runs out. And uh, the Kurgan Mafia had hired him, or I'm sorry, hired him, hired Sasha, another Sasha, it's confusing, had hired Sasha Soldat, another contract killer, to track down our Sasha, the super killer, to track him down and kill him. Soldat was one of uh, Solonik's old buddies. Sasha Soldat, also known as, known as Alexander Pustolov, 
pretty funny that these guys were uh, both known as either Sasha or Alexander. Uh, this guy sought to have taken out 35 targets himself in his murder for hire career, which would end in 1999 when he got arrested and was sentenced to 24 years in prison. So supposedly he's due to get out in just a few years. And anyway, when Soldat tracked Solonik down to his Athenian villa, the super killer welcomed him with open arms. They started to chat it up like old friends. And then at some point during their conversation, when Solonik turns his back to Soldat, Soldat quickly wraps a thin cord around his neck and strangles him to death. And how did that happen? Why, why would he let that happen? Why didn't he just flex his neck and tear the cord apart? Or why, why didn't he just reach back, grab the guy and just throw him through a wall or slam him on the ground and then just drown him by pissing in his mouth while saying some more cool shit? Sasha, old friend, you look thirsty. Maybe you like some piping hot apple cider. Showbiz, that is how they do it in Kurgan. Uh, sorry, not sure why he morphed kind of into Albert Fish there. Uh, showbiz. Uh, then Solonix killer gives him a, a signal to his other men uh, other men from Kurgan, uh, that crime syndicate, and they quickly subdue Solonik soldiers, you know, and then these guys kill Svetlana for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. More on how Solonik may have died just a second. The following day, February 1st, 1997, word gets out that Solonik had been killed. Uh, Greek newspapers publish articles claiming that a Russian, mo rob a Russian mob boss had been found dead 50 miles from Athens. Uh, supposedly, someone called the police and said that there was a dead body of an unknown man found in the woods near Athens. Uh, it was said that the body was hidden in a sack found uh, in a duffel uh, found with a duffel bag full of AK47s wigs forged documents and ammunition police officers identified the 37 year old man uh, as being choked with a cord burned with acid he was wearing clothes although there was nothing found in his pockets soon the police determined it was the body of Solonik however Moscow internal affairs uh, were apparently not convinced and a rumor soon spread that the body found was not Alexander's body but a double he'd hired you know, and maybe the acid was acid was kind of put on the body to obscure the dude's actual real identity. According to this rumor, the fingerprints taken from the corpse did not match Solonik's fingerprints in the Interpol database. Some believe he still lives today in secrecy. Why do people believe this? Probably because he's a fucking super killer. Who can, who can kill the super killer? I not I not die. One time I try to kill myself, but Grim Reaper too scared to come collect my body because I'm such bad guy, tough person. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. So, so that's the legend of Alexander Solonik, the super killer. Uh, how much of that is truth? How much of it is fiction? It's hard to say. By far the hardest subject we've done to find information on. I mean, there's almost nothing on this guy on the web other than just like, you know, those list kind of articles where it's like top 10 coolest things but and they're just they all repeat the same exact things and it's very little detail but i kind of like that with this story because it gives a gives a little bit of mystery to this guy right a little bit of modern folklore it's like a 90s boogeyman right they uh they call john wick baba yaga wick's hitman character definitely like i said earlier seems to be based on solonik uh solonik again credit with as many as 43 total contract kills 30 of those thought to be high level targets he was a legend in his own lifetime he was a real dude i'm confident of that uh, feared by both law enforcement and criminal organizations, you know, after a wave of cold-blooded killings, multiple arrests, daring escapes, forced to leave Russia for Athens, where he rented a mansion where he briefly shared uh, his bed with a 22-year-old Russian model. And then the killer became the prey. Dude dude made a lot of enemies, and they eventually, uh, you know, came to find him. All, all, all the bad shit he did eventually caught up with him. And an old friend and murder colleague fulfilled the contract that now had his name on it. Or did he? Again, is he, is he still out there somewhere? Is he still killing? Maybe he'd be 50, 59 years old. So it is possible, you know, because I feel like he would be like a Sly Stallone, a Schwarzenegger type 59, a Chuck fucking Norris type 59. I uh, hope you enjoyed his story. And uh, Mother Russia, she gets crazier and crazier every time we visit her, doesn't she? Time now for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the wild 90s were wild in Russia. Gopniks, scam artists, oligarchs, gangsters, and more. The economy tanked and a bit of anarchy ruled the day during Russia's transition from communism to capitalism. Number two, footnails. Don't think I'll ever uh, get that phrase fully out of my head. Footnails. A well-drawn smile and a long and slightly curved aquiline nose. Number three, dude escaped twice from prison, once or twice from a courtroom. One of his prison escapes was from a place no one had ever escaped from before. That, that does seem to be true. Number four, dude used a Basalt RPG-7, anti-tank weapon, 
rocket launcher used by the Russian military to take out a hit, to take out a gangster. He, he also beat up 12 Russian prisoners in one fight. He really was the Russian Chuck Norris joke in real life. If half of this stuff is true. And number five, something new. Apparently being a beauty queen during the wild 90s in Russia didn't uh, work out well for for a, for another model. Svetlana Kotova, Solonik's last girlfriend, was one of two beauty pageant finalists to die from hanging around a Russian gangster in the wild 90s. Alexandra Petrova claimed the title of the most beautiful woman in Russia when she was only 16. In just a few years, she rose rapidly in the modeling business and then met 35-year-old Konstantin Shaluvin prosperous entrepreneur who controlled local market spaces in the city, a gangster. And then someone put a hit on him. Someone shot him and two other businessmen, two other gangsters on the stairs of an apartment complex and a stray bullet hit Petrova. The 19 year old Miss Russia died on the way to the hospital just two days before her 20th birthday. Just like with Solonik's girlfriend. She hooked up with a dude who had a lot of criminal baggage and that baggage got her killed. Time suck. Top five takeaways. That was a reminder of uh, careful who you associate with. Man, the super killer has been sucked. Another strange Russian tale. I love it. It's my favorite country to go to uh, for these stories. Big thank you to the Time Suck team, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Paisley, the Bit Elixir app design crew, Logan and Kate at the Spicy Club running badmagicmerch.com and the socials, the script keeper, Zach Flannery. Uh, thanks to uh, the uh, all of you helping the all scene, or you know Liz Hernandez, the Countess of the Cult, the all seen eyes of the cult, Thanks to all of you for helping run the Cult of Curious Facebook group page, which continues to grow. Thankful for the community continuing to build. Um, thanks to Liz also for, for being in charge of the Bojangles emails. Thanks to Beefsteak for helping out so much with Discord. Also, thanks to uh, the many time suckers who send gifts to the Suck Dungeon each and every week. Uh, next week, we head right back to Russia. Ivan the Terrible is next week's sucktastic topic, the Grand Prince of Moscow. Uh, from 1533 to 1547, and then the first czar of Russia from 1547 to 1584. A man described as being intelligent, ambitious, and perhaps mentally unstable, and a huge piece of shit. Like Solonik, his tale is a mix of truth and legend. We'll do our best to differentiate between the two. Some see him as a natural or a national hero. Others see him as a monster. There are so many different stories about him. Some that paint him in you know, a great light of you know really kind of advancing uh, Russia into being like a superpower, and others just see him as a sociopath. Uh, some sources say he threw dogs and cats from the Kremlin walls to watch them suffer as a teen, roamed the Moscow streets with a gang of young thugs, drinking, knocking down old people, and raping women, and then disposing of rape victims by having them hanged, strangled, buried alive, or even thrown to the bears to be eaten. But did he really do any of that? Was he that terrible? Or is that just propaganda and rumor? We'll dig in. We'll look around. And now, let's check in with this week's fantastic Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Let's kick things off again with another uh, Cummins Law victim. Top shelf meat sack Ashley Patterson uh, may have nearly gotten fired recently. She wrote, I got Cummins Law. Hello, Master Sucker. My name is Ashley and I often listen to Time Suck on Spotify during my daily 45-ish minute commute to work. I work in an assisted living facility and I am an activity assistant. The community I work in actually currently has COVID-19 positive residents. Oh, wow. Be careful. Despite this, we have been trying to entertain everyone the best way we can, uh, the best we can, given the constantly changing regulations regarding distancing and isolation. Today at work, we were doing a Name That Tune event in one of our main common areas. We used our personal cell phones and a Bluetooth speaker to play music. Today, I was setting up the speaker and opened my Spotify, and somehow on the actual speaker, uh, accidentally pressed play, which resumed the Robert Burdella episode. Eek. At full volume. <laughs> echoing throughout the entire first floor of our facility all you could hear was bob pushed his fist and forearm into his rectum i was mortified for about five minutes thank fuck most of our residents have dementia <laughs> keep on sucking ashley oh my god what a what a weird lucky thing to to have to have all of the people you're working with have dementia and not get fired for that uh, or at least get in a lot of trouble. <sighs> yeah, that, that cracked me up. What a ridiculous moment. I'm sure I'm sure you were preposterously embarrassed to have everybody. I can't imagine the questions you got <laughs> from people. Thank you, Ashley. Now I'd like to share some fan fiction. Oh man, we had some fan fiction on the, on the Secret Suck last Thursday. Now we got fan fiction on Time Suck now. Inspired by the recent Multiverse Suck, Super Sucker Katie Chandler let her imagination run buck wild. 
Katie wrote, hey, Master Sucker, I hope this finds you, your family, and the Time Suck team well. I want to start this by saying I'm a very visual thinker. Basically, when people say something, I can picture it immediately. Peanut butter is not a nice thing to picture. Oh, my bad. Also helps me write. Once I get something stuck in my head for a story idea, I cannot get it out of my head until I write it out. I love that. This brings me to you and imagining you researching the multiverse theory. I hope you enjoy it. So here it goes. Lindsay stood in the kitchen trying to decide what to make for dinner when she heard the crazed voice coming up the stairs from where their bedroom and living area was. Both of the dogs ran frantically up the stairs, fear in their eyes. She held on to her amulet <laughs> to ward off any evil that might have caused her dogs to panic. That's nailed her. Perfect. She went down the stairs, glancing into the mirror as she passed, thinking about Dan's new time sick episode on the multiverse theory. Could there be one on the other side of that mirror? When she got to the bottom of the stairs, she found Dan darting across the room, papers scattered all over their new carpet, a pin board propped up against the sofa. There were pictures of all the scientists he had researched for the topic, along with pictures of the galaxy, as well as printouts of words she knew his mush mouth could not pronounce. Nailed it. All the clippings and pictures were connected by red string wrapped around the pins that held them in place. Dan, she said, what the actual fuck is going on? He kept muttering under his breath, grabbing a marker that was next to 15 cans of Black Rifle coffee. <laughs> Dan started drawing shapes on the walls and shading them as, as his muttering grew faster. Dan, no, stop. What are you doing? She yanked the marker out of his trembling hand. Lindsay, he shouted. Oh, thank God you're here. I, I figured it out. I, I figured it all out. G guess what? The possibility of time travel is real. We have, to, we have to get to the other reality because it's real there because of the discoveries. He darted over time his, his, his board and held it up properly for her to see. Oh, these beautiful bastards. The fact that Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell ran up the stairs proves it. Dan dropped the board and grabbed the stunned Lindsay by the hand and dragged her into the room. Dan, are you fucking with me? She asked. Fucking with you? Why would I be fucking with you? He asked seriously before making his way to the bed. The parallel universes are created by each decision we make. Look, look, look. Before you decided to make the bed this way, Shadow Lindsay decided to not make the bed. Her choice created more parallel words based on that choice. And you see, you see how you placed a crystal here. Shadow Lindsay placed it by the TV, which is just another portal to another realm. It's so simple. How has no one else figured this shit out? You're scaring me. Dan, what the hell is wrong with you? Lindsay went to leave the room as Dan hurled her largest crystal at the wall. She screamed and jumped as she looked back at her deranged husband. See, I chose to throw your stupid crystal at the wall, and Shadow Dan chose not to. Wait! Dan grabbed his hair with both hands. What if I'm Shadow Dan? What if I'm not the real Dan, and I was created by the real Dan, and now I'm not Shadow Dan? What if Shadow... I can't take it anymore! We have to climb through this mirror. You grab the dogs, I'll grab the kids. Three days later at the hospital, Dan slowly opened his eyes, the bright fluorescent light shining down upon him. Am I dead? No, but you're going to wish you were if you ever do that shit again. Lindsay's annoyed voice came from his left. He looked at her beautiful face as she said, after this, you can never, ever say shit about my crystals ever again. Nice. The end. Hope you enjoyed it. It was by no means my best work, but it gave me a laugh typing it over my lunch. Stay safe, you guys. Love, Katie Chandler. Katie, I love that. I love little stories like that. Very fun. Yes, and I did feel like that, that crazy during the multiverse stuff. And now we have kick-ass sack, Danny Perillo sharing a message regarding some frontline essential workers he thinks deserve a little more thanks during our pandemic, and I have to agree with him. He wrote, Hail to the king mother sucker himself. My name is Danny. I've been a long time listening to your stand-up and a devout member of the Cult of Curious since your early sucks. I got on back when you did Vlad the Impaler. I wanted to reach out because as much as we've given thanks to medical workers, police, fire, uh, you know, uh, fighters, uh, truckers, grocery workers, etc., I feel that one group of essential workers has been left out. Cleaners. Dormant janitors like myself. We make sure that the, you know, the buildings people work in, apartment buildings, hospitals, and schools are clean and disinfected every day so everyone can be healthy and safe while our health and safety is at risk. I don't mean to sound preachy, but it just bugs me a little bit because we don't get the same recognition other professions get. While I'm working alone on these long nights in my building in New York City, I always have the suck to keep me going. The show has got me through rough times. The Doc Holiday suck came a week after my grandfather passed away and it helped me out immensely. I know the suck will continue to get through, get me through my weeks, and I always look forward to a new episode every Monday. And if you could, could you give a shout out to my fiance, Mary? I, I done and did and done. Uh, shout out to Mary. Mary, sound like you, you're getting married to a good dude. And uh, we're hopefully get, still getting married this October, so fingers crossed. And I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with the greatest woman in the world. That's beautiful. Good man. Sorry for the long message. Hoping to get your zapples in a twist. Nope. Give Bojangles a pat on the head for me. Don't forget to fill his water dish. Oh, yeah, and one more thing. Keep on sucking. Hope to see you next time you come to the Big Apple, your devo devoted space lizard, Danny. Oh, uh, well, you know, you're right, Danny. A lot of people doing a lot of good things for everybody else right now, including the people who have to uh, keep everything clean. My brother-in-law, Jason Radzeminski, does the same thing out in Cleveland. 
He's been working crazy long hours. So uh, thanks to you, thanks to uh, Jason Radzeminski and everyone else who is, who is disinfecting everything so that everybody else can do their job with a little more peace of mind. Very important. Uh, and finally, I'll end with uh, sucker Matt Russo, super sucker, sharing some more COVID-19 food for thought. Uh, dear Grandmaster the Suck and everyone on the Time Suck team, hope you're all doing well, staying healthy. Normally, I try to stay out of stuff like this. But lately, I felt the need to start more conversations around this topic. Sorry in advance for the long email, but I wanted this to be thorough because I think this protest conversation uh, needs to more focus on the nuances. I've included some embedded links to the sources for information I found just in case you want to check out those pages. Now for the lengthy part. In my opinion, the protesters either didn't communicate their argument well or they weren't properly focused on their goal. Two main points that I think get lost in the conversation or aren't discussed enough are below. First, widespread testing should be a major focus of anyone advocating to reopen. If a state reopens, but business owners or customers aren't comfortable going out, that has a huge impact on small businesses and their former employees. Specifically, that pushes a responsibility to business owners on whether or not they will reopen. Fortunately, if owners choose to not reopen, their employees can stay on unemployment. According to an NPR article that looks specifically at Georgia, it may differ from state to state. However, if owners do choose to reopen, but significantly fewer people are patronizing their business, they're still financially burdened. But now they and their employees are being put at increased risk for COVID-19. However, the fear that might cause businesses to not reopen or customers not to show up would likely be eased if we had a plan that involved widespread testing. So infected individuals are told to quarantine for two weeks prior to reentering the workforce or attending social gatherings. Even though this could have its own problems with people not quarantining, or quarantining because they feel fine despite testing positive for coronavirus is definitely something that would be a big help. Uh, it's not about getting tested before entering every single place. It's about identifying those infected early in this process so that they can individually be quarantined rather than having a widespread stay-at-home order. Also, this wouldn't include taking people's temperatures regularly because a major problem with the virus is that it's asymptomatic. People can spread it without knowing they have it. Taking someone's temperature doesn't have a very good gauge to find out if one's infected or not. Uh, second, further economic relief like the CARES Act should be a top priority for protesters. If the argument is truly about economy and making sure people can keep their businesses alive and income safe, the more legislation like CARES, uh, uh, like the CARES Act can help immensely. The Paytech Protection Program is probably the most important part, in my opinion, when implemented effectively. Uh, for example, ensuring that funds go to small businesses and not to places like the Shake Shack or the L.A. Lakers. Uh, this system would help small businesses and their employees financially survive quarantine by providing funds to pay salaries, benefits, and business expenses while states figure out how to safely and effectively reopen. Now you might be concerned that this will raise the national debt. The U.S. national debt as of now is over $25 trillion, and the CARES Act contributes about $2 trillion to that according to the U.S. Treasury. However, it's important to note that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act contributed about the same amount to our debt through decreased federal revenue. Now, you might argue that the tax reform is also, in theory, expected to grow the economy by 2% over time, uh, which is essentially trickle-down economics. I don't think that would actually work, but we'll say it will for the sake of this argument. But I think taking a $2 trillion hit to the national debt in order to keep the economy from totally collapsing and ensure the health of the American people makes just as much sense as doing it to hopefully grow the economy a bit. I want to make it clear that this isn't an argument to keep having the government pass legislation until there's a vaccine. It's just an argument that the, this should be part of the plan to reopen. Use this kind of legislation to buy time to plan out a more effective and safe way to open states back up in the near future. This also is to make the point that if it is truly about the economy and not because people are, oh, this is also to make the point that if it is truly about the economy and not because people are just sick of staying at home, this is at least one potential solution where you can prop up the economy, even just for a little while, and continue to stay at home until reopening is thoroughly planned out. Lastly, there are two arguments I've heard from protesters that I don't think hold much water. One is that Americans are res uh, responsible, so just tell us to social distance we can take care of ourselves. This is a bad argument. One counterargument is that you can't assert that Americans are responsible when a portion of our population drank bleach. <laughs> More importantly, this argument relies on the idea that every single American is responsible will follow rules. Anyone who has ever interacted with other meat sacks can tell you that's not the case. Yeah, that's true. And with the virus that spreads so easily from uh, asymptomatic people, it only takes a very small subset acting irresponsibly to kickstart another wave of infection. Two, the governors are abusing their powers by telling us what to do. I tend to disagree with this argument. No governor wants their citizens to be out of work. That doesn't make sense. These leaders, leaders are being forced to either err on the side of caution and extend stay-at-home orders or reopen the state and risk a second wave of infection. Also, the CDC White House guidelines give clear benchmarks that states need to meet. 
So really, governors that are acting responsibly are referring to guidelines set forth by a federal agency and the Trump administration not wielding their power with reckless abandon. Sorry for the long email, just wanted to emphasize the complexity of this debate. It doesn't have to be as simple as reopen to an unsafe environment or don't reopen until there's a vaccine. It can be about how we move forward in a way that makes the most sense. Thank you and the Time Suck team for all that you guys do. You're helping us all become better meat sacks by pushing us to think critically. And I can't tell you how much I personally appreciate the, uh, appreciate the difference it's had on my life. Hail Nimrod. Praise Bojangles. Thanks again and stay healthy. Best, Matt. Holy shit, Matt. Man, you very, uh, 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 you, you laid out a very complex email, I thought, in, in, in a very understandable way. Man, Matt Russo, good job, man. Yeah, testing, testing, testing. And I, and I love that, yes, it's a nuanced issue. And that's the most important takeaway, I think, from what you said, is it's not a black and white thing. It's not just, fuck it, open it all up. It, uh, or the other side of, let's shelter in place forever. It doesn't have to be either of those extremes. There can be a middle ground that focuses on both health and the economy. And, you know, life in general, I think um, most of the time, the answer is somewhere in the middle of the extremes. The extremes are very, very rarely ever correct. Uh, so thanks for sending that in. I'm glad this suck helps you. I love being able to get, you know, emails like that from listeners like you. It, uh, it's very cool, man, just to give us all more to think about and just to, just to spark more critical thinking in, in everyone. So thank you, Matt. Keep safe. And, uh, and thanks everyone for sending in the awesome time sucker updates every single week. Thanks time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Well, that's all for time suck this week. Scared to death. Uh, coming out, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow night, secret suck on, on Thursday. I hope you have a great week. Uh, I hope you don't end up, you know, as a, as the subject of a contract killing. And most, more, most importantly, more than anything, I, I just, I hope, I hope you, you keep on sucking, please you just keep on sucking and fight and don't let the bad guy try and take you away. It's not good for anyone. <laughs> Excuse me, I left watch at home. Do you have time? Don't shoot. That's wrong answer. It's bullet head o'clock. Ah!